into order. Can you do that? Okay, great. Yep. We can start. Okay, I call the meeting to order. Waitley Select Board meeting of August 26, 2020. First item on the agenda is the meeting minutes from August 12th. Any comments, discussion? I would make a move to uh, a motion to approve the meetings from Second. August 12th. Second. Okay, uh, roll call vote, uh, Joyce? Aye. Jonathan? Yes. Fred, yes. Okay, moving on, vendor and payroll warrants. Any uh, comments or discussion? No, no comments from me. Okay, public comment. Is there anybody on that wishes to comment on items that are not listed on the agenda? No, okay, moving on. Brad. 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 Yes. Brad. Yes. Can you hear me? Mm. Brad, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Don Skrowski. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to see if the select board would entertain. Uh, some help in getting that crossing here on Christian Lane straightened out a little bit. Ever since they did the repair, uh, the noise is incredible. If you have a trailer or a landscaper go through, it sounds like a rocket's going off. And it, you know it's constant all day long because you got trailers from uh, Yankee Candle, you got Lashway running through. And it's even worse on Tuesdays because you have the auction open and all the cattle wagons and things are running through and it's just incredible. I'd invite you guys to sit here at my house and listen to that and you get the picture of what I'm talking about. It sounds like a vehicle's crashing every time they go over the tracks. You're talking the railroad tracks crossing. Yeah, right here at Christian Lane. Yeah, well. And I know Keith did a little work there because he was having trouble or was thinking he might have a problem uh, with a plow during the winter, but you know, the crossing was much better before they did this repair work on it. Well, yeah, well, it, it was rough after they, they did the, the, I guess the railroad did the repair work, then somebody made it a little smoother after that. I don't know whether that was Keith or, or the railroad well, came Keith, back. He tried to do something there, but it really didn't do much. And, you know, I just wonder if the selectmen have any way to contact the railroad and see if something can be done to improve this. You go to Hatfield, it's a depot road crossing or in, in South Deerfield, you don't even feel yourself going across the tracks. And over here, your whole front end is bouncing around when you go over the tracks. And I don't care how slow you're going. Yeah, well, I've, I've, I've heard similar stories, Don, that, you know, it, it, it's to equate it to a, a little kid loves going over that it can take a little ride. So it, it is a pretty big bubble there. Yeah, you're right. Keith, did you want to say something about it? Sure, I, I can and I can interject. Um, Don Dufault came and saw me this morning also in regards to this. And as I told him, the issue that we have is the the rail itself is the highest point. And what should happen is if you go down and look at it, compare a Christian Lane to Egypt Road, they're totally different in the aspect that um, the rail is set down in embedded more at Egypt Road so that when you go over, <clears throat> it's a smooth transition. Whereas in our case on Christian Lane, the rail is the highest point. And that's one of the reasons why we were having issues and the railroad was coming to me, telling me that we've got to do something because our plows are damaging it. Um, now that I've looked into it a little bit more, um, I have contact with Mass. The, you know, the, the rail 
portion of Mass DOT, and I can certainly contact them and reach out to them and maybe set up something where um, whether it be Brian and myself or anybody else that might want to meet with them out there, let me see what I can get from talking with Mass DOT. So Keith, have you done any of the paving there at all? Yeah, we we did some, again, to try to minimize some of the the noise and the complaints, but again, it it can't, I can't do anything more there because the rails are the highest point and they should not be. Can I make a comment? Sure, go ahead, Donnie. You know, Keith, I'm not pointing a finger at you by any means. Nothing you did there created a problem. It existed. And I think No, I, I understand that. I'm not I'm not taking it that way. I'm just saying that I tried to minim, you know minimize it a little bit, but there's just nothing more that I can do. Yeah, I you know, you know how they have that uh, rubber gasket in there, Keith? Yep. Somebody told me that they got the wrong one in there when they were installing that. And the guy just said, go ahead and do it. Let's finish this. And so I, I, that's part of the problem. But you know, anything you guys could do would be greatly appreciated. You know, I, to be honest with you, I'm hard of hearing. So at night I take my hearing aids out. So it doesn't bother me. But when you're here during the day, it's awful. You can, you can almost feel the vibration. Well, not to not to change the subject a little bit, but that's similar to what um, speed bumps do. They make a lot of noise. Yeah, but you know, speed's another factor on this road. This but I'm metal. not going to go into that. But this is metal. But this, you know, it's just it's just a stir. It's disturbing, you know. And I I want something done. Okay, so can we leave it up to Keith? I'll. Uh look into that further and, and get back with uh, with the board or, or, or Brian to find out, to learn what you found out and uh, we can decide if we need to take some action. It okay. sounds like a reasonable thing to do. Okay. I would support that. Yeah, that will send back to me as well so I, I can know where we stand on this. Is that okay, Brian? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I have his email. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Okay. Thank you, Don. Thanks, Don. All right, guys. Okay. Just, we were in the public comment section. We had a few more people join us. Does anybody else have public comment on items not on the agenda? No. Okay. Moving on. Uh, next item is a scheduled appointment which is a public forum on the draft 2020 Whateley multi-hazard mitigation plan. And for this, I think we've got from uh, Kimberly from uh, FERCOG was one of our, uh, I guess the, the lead uh, organization that the lead person that helped develop this uh, with a committee also uh, made up of various members of the town various departments. Uh, I'll leave it up to, I'll turn it over to Kimberly. I think you have some presentation you want to make and then we can open it up for comment. <clears throat> Kimberly, I think you're muted. <laughs> <Been there>. Sorry. <laughs> By the time the pandemic is over, I will have figured this out. <laughs> um, <laughs> So thank you. Uh, and I did you want to bring up the presentation, Brian, or did you want to have me do it? Um, I can bring it up for you. Okay, thanks. Just tell me when you want to change. Okay. Um, so th uh, thank you for having me tonight. Um, this is the start of a two-week public comment period on the hazard Mitigation plan update. This plan, once it's approved by FEMA, will be valid for five years. And the purpose of the plan is to um, have projects 
or uh, include information about projects that will, if they are built, um, reduce potential losses from future disasters. So these projects can um, basically be uh, categorized in three ways, projects that protect critical facilities and infrastructure, projects that involve public education and outreach, and projects that involve um, local or regional plans and regulations, specifically like land use regulations, zoning regulations. So the mitigation plan identifies the natural hazards that impact the town and actions to reduce losses from these hazards. Next slide, please. And in 2014, when we completed this work for the town, we looked at historic hazard events, the frequency, the magnitude, and the damages associated with those. We basically had a look back period of about two decades. Um, a very um, kind of broad vulnerability assessment was done for flooding. As, you, as men, many of you might know, we don't have digital floodplain mapping for Franklin County. So, um, you know, it's a bit, uh, it's somewhat difficult to do um, a very detailed vulnerability assessment without those digital maps. But we did uh, work with the town committee to prioritize all the hazards and included action items for each of the hazards. Next slide, please. So you'll see in this slide, um, the blue highlighted hazards were the ones that were done in 2014. Um, and the 2020 plan includes three new hazards, drought, invasive species, and temperature extremes. And temperature extremes cover those um, like heat waves as well as um, low or cold temperature extremes. So there might be a fly in, Brian, when you, if you hit advance. Um, so what we're seeing is climate change is exposing us to um, these hazards more frequently and the hazards are also, the magnitude of them is bigger. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in the uh, next couple of slides. So the changing climate, we're already seeing um, higher temperatures for longer period of periods of time, shorter winters, more frequent and intense storms, rainfall events, for example, and droughts. We're currently in a, a drought situation right now. And so climate change, again, is amplifying the risks that communities already face from natural hazard events because these events are happening um, with more frequency and they're generally bigger storms and they last for a longer time. So the plan that we worked on um, this time around is uh, the format of it mirrors what the state recently put out in 2018, which is a climate adaptation and natural hazard mitigation plan. So you'll see that climate change is kind of woven um, throughout the plan. Uh, next slide, please. So this information on the next couple of slides about some of the climate changes that we're seeing already and what is projected um, to be observed. This information is available on resilientma.org, which is a state website that was produced as part of the effort to do the climate, the state climate change um, adaptation and hazard mitigation plan. So for any of the you that might be um, data wonks and like looking at interactive graphs and kind of playing around with the data, this is the website for you. Um, it's actually a great clearinghouse of information and they also include um, adaptation and mitigation strategies for different sectors on this website as well. So what we're seeing in this graph right now is um, the annual average temperatures that um, are projected under the two um, emission scenarios. And basically, uh, to summarize this, the average annual temperature is projected to increase about almost five and a half degrees by the mid 
middle of this century and about seven and a half degrees by the end of this century. Next slide. So extreme temperatures, um, we're seeing already, we're seeing days with temperatures above 90 degrees, more of, of those days. Um, and they're also happening earlier in the season. So by the 2050s, by the middle of this century, which isn't that far away, um, the projected increase in the number of um, days with temperatures above 90 degrees is expected to be 32. And um, one thing I'll point out about this, this data as well, and if you visit the website, you'll see that what they've done is they, it's called downscaling it. So they've taken climate change modeling and data and the scientists that um, work to compile this have actually uh, made it um, available at the county level. So you'll see this is Franklin County, um, Massachusetts data, or if you're working at a watershed scale like the Deerfield River watershed or the Connecticut River watershed, you can look at data um, at that scale as well. Next slide. Is it okay to ask a question about these slides while we go along? Sure. Um, like on the previous slide, what does they talk about max, median, and min? I mean, I understand the graph trend is up and that the width of this is bigger, but are, it can't really be true that the maximum temperature in Massachusetts in 2020 was 48 degrees. Right? That, so and when they say max and min, what do they mean by max and min in this case? Um, let me see. So under the modeled, and you're talking about modeled as degrees Fahrenheit? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. an annual average temperature. But what it, when they say maximum? So I mean, the maximum, the way I understand it is that the maximum, so the red, the red mm -hmm. line on the graph and the red shaded area below, that is the range under um, a modeling scenario that assumes, um, if you will, like ma maximum emissions. Okay. And, and then the blue is if emissions are um, controlled or somehow scaled okay. back. So that's the, the kind of minimum okay. increase that we would see. So the, so the average temperature could fall anywhere in there and where it falls might depend on what we do about emissions. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I understood that one then. And so maybe that's the same thing on the next graph. I just yes. think I understand what the max and min meant. So thank you very much. I'm sorry to interrupt you. And, and Joyce, I would just piggyback onto that because I, I think, I mean, it would be wonderful. And I, Kim, I understand that this isn't your document, um, but to, to clarify that a little bit more because it's not, it's not a user-friendly statement. I, I don't right. think, but I, you know, averages, you know, it, it, the maximum median, median and min is a range that they're talking about. Right. And, and I'll thank you, Jonathan, and I'll take a look at the narrative in the report and see, mm -hmm. I think we tried to make it accessible in the report, but I can look at it and see if there's additional wordsmithing I can do. Okay, thank you. Let me just write myself a note here about that. Okay, um, we can go to the next slide. So changes in precipitation, um, we're already seeing that with these very um, intense, very short <coughs> that drop an incredible amount of rain um, in a very short period of time. This uh, figure that shows the observed increase in heavy, heavy precipitation, so this is what has actually been seen by looking back at the data um, collected between 1958 to 2012, and you'll see that the area that includes Massachusetts has seen a 71% increase in these um, heavy storm events. And I mean, we all know that, we all see that already. Um, something that seems almost um, 
counterintuitive is that um, we can be in a drought uh, situation like we are right now, but still get one of these big gully washer short storms, but it doesn't really soak into the ground, recharge the groundwater, um, recharge wells, recharge streams. Um, we're also seeing less snowpack in the winter, which is really important for aquifer recharge. Um, when we get our spring melt, we're getting less water, um, but more rain. And so if the ground is frozen and we're getting rain, that's not helping our streams and aquifers and um, wells. Next slide, please. So um, this slide just kind of reiterates a point I had made earlier about how climate change is um, uh, affecting the hazard or the storm events that we're already used to having because the storms occur more often, they are more intense, they last longer, and they're bigger. Um, and these um, situations with these extreme storms is only uh, projected to increase due to climate change. Next slide. So in the 2020 plan, we looked at past, current, and future hazards, kind of through, again, the lens of climate change. And we discuss in the section on each of these hazards how climate change increases risks. And we broke it down into um, three categories, infrastructure, society, which are the residents of the town, and the environment. And you'll see when we um, kick off the municipal vulnerability preparedness project that those three um, uh, sectors are the same sectors that the MVP program uh, looks at. There's a lot of overlap between the hazard mitigation plan and the MVP plan. So as part of the hazard mitigation plan, we uh, determined which are the top priority hazards um, currently and in the future, again, thinking about climate change. And once the MVP project is completed, um, those results, those priorities, those projects are gonna be incorporated by um, reference into the hazard mitigation plan because Due to COVID-19, we weren't able to um, kind of do the plans concurrently um, or at least somewhat concurrently as we had originally hoped. And, um, but, you know, um, we recognize that there are probably, there are likely to be really good projects in that are identified as part of the MVP projects that also might be eligible for hazard mitigation grant funding. So we've made that connection. Um, next slide, please. So as part of the hazard identification and risk analysis, uh, we ended, we talked about each of the hazards the location of occurrence, the probability of future events, and the impacts to the town, and came up with an overall hazard vulnerability rating for each of the hazards, which is high, medium, and low. Um, next slide. So that ranking feeds into um, the problem statements that were done for each hazard, and then eventually the action plan items. The vulnerability assessment that we did uh, primarily focused, again, it's very high, you know, very kind of high level, but we focused on vulnerable populations in Waitley because we do have data for those um, populations 65 years and older, populations with a disability, populations who speak English less than very well. Um, and then there are also vulnerable households. Um, low income households, householders that um, are the head of household is age 65 years or older and living alone and households without access to a vehicle. Um, so we talked about the potential impacts of the hazards on these vulnerable populations and um, as well as, you know, had general information about the health impacts economic impacts, infrastructure impacts, and environmental impacts. So this is kind of like a first 
broad look at all of this and if the town were um, really interesting, interested in delving deeper into any of these um, vulnerability assessments, that's something that um, could be funded by an MVP action grant. Um, so this is a nice example of kind of how, how the two projects are related. Next slide, please. So I mentioned flood, the hazard problem statements that were developed. So here's just an example um, of the problem statements for flooding. And um, we also, in addition to developing these, we evaluated current mitigation strategies, the status of uh, the action items in the 2014 plan, and then put together the 2020 action plan. So this is um, a process that's very prescribed by FEMA. We have to hit kind of all the um, high points, so to speak, or make sure we like tick all the boxes um, for the FEMA guidance for a hazard mitigation plan, um, which we've done. Next slide. So this is probably hard to read, but it's just one of the pages. Um, I think it's the first page of the 2020 action plan um, to give you an example. Uh, new action items are noted as such. They're given a priority when an action item was um, brought over from the 2014 plan. It was likely updated or uh, reworked based on work that the town might have done in the intervening time since the 2014 plan. Um, we've also identified potential funding sources, estimated cost, <clears throat> who the responsible department and board would be, and um, what the potential benefits are to society, infrastructure, and the environment. So, um, Amy, I, this should be posted on the website. I think Amy sent this out as a PDF to the committee members as well as the select board members. So if you have um, an opportunity over the next two weeks, I know that everyone's time is very um, precious and we're already overbooked, but um, I think rather than reading the 250 page plan, um, if you could focus on the like six or seven pages of the action plan and give um, feedback to Brian on that, that would be uh, very much appreciated. Uh, next slide, please. So then the next steps um, after the action plan is reviewed and we receive any more feedback during the two week um, comment period, then, um, and actually I think Brian wants the comments submitted to him, not to me. So you can disregard that. I mean, I'm happy to take the comments as well, but um, the next step once the plan is um, out of the public review period and any updates are made, it's sent to MEMA and um, then on to FEMA for review and approval. The um, contract for this work ends December 30th of 2020. So we're on track, um, you know, to meet that deadline. We shouldn't have any problem. MEMA and FEMA are turning these around uh, pretty quickly, which is great. And we're using a template that um, has been approved, you know, for I think like six or seven towns already. Um, so, which is good news. And then I mentioned the MVP workshop. Um, we'll be holding that this fall and um, completing the designation process for the town, hopefully in early 2021. So um, I don't know how much, how much time we have on the agenda. If you wanted me, Brian, to go through the action plan in any detail, or we can just open it up for discussion and questions. Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I thought that Whitley was already designated as an MVP community. Is that not accurate? No, not yet. We have an MVP planning grant. Okay, but we have to achieve the designation. Okay, okay. I thought we had. I apologize. I think this is great. 
Yeah, I think I want a little time to kind of delve in before I have uh, a lot more questions. I know, I mean, there was one question that came to mind, but mm -hmm. it, it might be kind of too in the weeds. Yeah. Uh, and it was about like, how did, which hazards get the, you know, the high and the low and the medium designation, but my guess is that's details is going to be in the 243 pages. It is. <laughs> rather, than, rather than have you try to explain all those details, maybe I should just read it. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that if I were asked, for example, well, why is flood a medium risk and um, there are flooding uh, is actually says low risk here, but dam failures are low, but, but why are hurricanes and tropical storms medium and stuff? That's the kind of question, if I had that question, yeah. it might be better to go look at um, the details and find out, because it might really be, you know, too much detail to go into at this kind of a meeting. Is that a reasonable way of looking at this? I think so. I think so, Joyce, because again, there's like a, um, a methodology that FEMA sets out that we mm -hmm. use to do this. And um, it's also, so what I showed you was the initial vulnerability assessment. And then later on in the plan, actually the committee worked to identify and or to prioritize the hazards, which it almost seems kind of mm -hmm. redundant in a way, but that's FEMA for you. So mm -hmm. it could be that even though flooding is shown as medium in that table earlier in the plan, that the final overall ranking for the hazard was high. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, please feel free, like once you um, look at the narrative, if you have any other questions about it, and those are the types of things that we can um, change during the comment period if there's a reason to change the, the ranking of a hazard. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I think a, a lot of it was <laughs> the, the committee's, uh, I guess, consensus of, of how we evaluated and rated each one of these hazards or, or action mm -hmm. items. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not gonna find in the report that you know six members said this and four said this or two said low. Mm -hmm. uh, we never recorded it that way. And it was kind of consensus as we talked to the, of each item, what the committee decided on. Uh, I, I guess, and, and that's what you see in the plan is based on the committee's feelings, uh, uh, in, information they know about certain activities in town, their experiences in town. And mm -hmm. it comes from, you know, we had highway department, we had police, uh, fire department, uh, EMS was there. Uh, so it's it's all the departments, various departments were involved in it. So, yeah, is is there, and, and and I may answer this myself if I read when I read the the most of the report. I can't commit to two hundred and forty nine <laughs> pages. Um, but is there a section that talks about sort of a, a an aggregate response regionally as opposed to town by town? Um, yes. So much of this is regional because we're, you know, such, such small communities and what happens in X town really impacts what hap the, the realities of Y town. Yes. So to some degree, the answer is yes. I mean, we do have information about um, you know, like background on the hazard events that, you know, is that like the Franklin County scale or we might talk about, you know, something that happened in Greenfield as an illustration of a certain hazard event. But I think that the structure of these plans, it makes it kind of difficult to cross beyond um, a municipal border. What has more um, flexibility in that regard is the MVP process. So for example, in Ashfield and Conway, the two towns that share the South River watershed did a joint MVP planning exercise to get designation um, as a two town kind of collaboration. Northfield and Warwick are doing um, a joint uh, MVP planning exercise. So, I mean, Whaley's grant has already been awarded, but you could, as part of the MVP process, and, you know, I can make a note to, to look and ch check to see which of the surrounding towns 
ha have done the MVP process. And so um, Deerfield, for example, comes to mind. I mean, you, the town of Waitley has part of Deerfield's public water supply, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you have Northampton's public water supply. So the, and, the, and Hatfield is a, has some tangential impact as well. Right. So those are um, opportunities to think beyond the, um, the town borders and to look at what those communities have done um, or planning to do as part of the MVP process. So I think that's a really great point. Um, the hazard mitigation plans, it's a little bit um, harder to do, but because um, the COG is typically helping uh, our town to do these plans, we try to identify um, intermunicipal opportunities when we're aware of them. Did the PVPC do a similar initiative that you know of? I'm sure, I'm sure they probably did um, because MEMA, um, you know, had these planning grants available and, but I don't know which towns PVPC was working on during this same time period. But we, we did look at some impacts on surrounding towns and even even what surrounding towns would would affect us to a limited degree uh, and mostly for information and coordination with other towns mutual aid mutual assistance that kind of stuff we, we did talk about that you know mm -hmm. if we had an event that we didn't have enough resources for what would we do we, we, we did have some discussion on that but not as far as you know if something major happened in Deerfield how is that going to affect Waitley? Uh, you know, it's really a lot of speculation and, and we didn't get into all that level of detail. Right. And that's an opportunity um, in the MVP process where we can delve into that in more detail because FEMA in these hazard mitigation plans, um, you can have emergency response and preparedness um, language and action items, but FEMA is not going to fund those. Um, however, the MVP program would be more interested in, in that. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So, so Brian, you want the comments to come to you. That's what it said on the, um, the stakeholder letter that Amy sent out. Is that still okay? I was muted. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, that's fine. It, it, we'll forward them along to you. Yep. All right. Okay, anybody else have comments uh, for Kimberly or anybody else on this item? Well, I just want to say thank you to um, all the folks that worked with us on this plan. Several of them are, are on the Zoom um, meeting tonight. It's always a pleasure to work in Waitley been uh, <laughs> at the COG for 18 years now, and it's just like, you guys are the best. Um, and so looking forward to getting the MVP plan um, underway, and we'll be working with Brian to coordinate uh, that workshop, hopefully sometime in October. Okay, thank you, uh, you and Amy, uh, I mean, uh, Kimberly, and all of FERCOG's help. There's others I know that helped you with this as well, so. Yeah. Appreciate all your comments and and help in developing this plan. Okay. Yes, thank you. All right. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Moving on, our next item is the uh, COVID-19 state of emergency. And we got a, a few items on here. To, uh, first is a review, discuss, review, consider modifications to our directives on employees and on town buildings. Brian, is there something we need to discuss or change here? Um, I don't have any recommendations. It's, it's a standing item in case something pops up within 48 hours since we post. Um, there's still active cases in town uh, that are being managed by the, uh, the Board of Health. They're gonna be, um, one change that's happening is that 
um, the Foothills Health District is going to be hiring their own public nurse and they're not going to be using the Northampton public nursing program. So that'll be a change and that's a change that's going to, I believe it starts September 1st. Um, I have all the confidence that they'll, they'll make the appropriate handoff that needs to be made, but that's one change that the Board of the Board of Health and Foot through the Foothills Health District has made, but I don't I don't see a reason to address any of these orders. Brian or Fred, okay. I just I just had one one thing. I know it's come up a couple of times, so I just wanted to um, maybe answer any questions you guys might have as far as the police station with the lobby being locked. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if anybody has any questions or or opinions of what what we should be doing. I just know there's been some discussion that, that I wasn't part of before, so I just wanted to offer um, any help that I could. Well, one, thing we, one thing we weren't sure of during the, I guess, daytime or, or hours when, when, when uh, the station is manned, uh, either first or second shift, is the lobby open or is it, or is it closed still? Is it closed? It's, it's closed. The entire building is locked. Yeah, All the time. To the, to the public. So Correct. Even if you're in the building. Yes. Okay. And we're only we're only bringing somebody in to take a report or something like that if they call ahead of time and or we make an appointment. So we're not just taking walk-ins. We've we've gone out to the parking lot to talk to people, um, but that's just since since the beginning. That's what we've been doing the same the same thing. We've had a lot of people call us to make an appointment to come down and drop off some medication, um, or they'll drop it off. If they see somebody here, they'll they'll ring the bell and and we'll go out and, and get it and throw it in the in the uh, kiosk for them. So so, but it's it's currently locked all the time. Is there's so there's a doorbell or something outside? There is yes, yep. There's a doorbell. Plus there's the sign posted with all the numbers to to get a hold of dispatch, the police station, our email addresses, any way they they want to get a hold of us. So people have a way. Is is this your your decision to, to operate this way, or is it something that came from the state in regard to police stations? No, well, it came from the select board initially when all town buildings were closed right. um, for the public, and it was never it was never discussed again in any modifications. It's just it's been that way since since the get go. Because nothing's changed as far as the uh, the, the COVID nineteen coronavirus, whatever right. you want to call it. Um, nothing's changed since then, so we we've, we've kind of stayed with the same order. We haven't just opened it up to the public to come in and out as they as they choose. We've just been doing the same thing right from that initial order. So if a person happens to come up to the door, mm -hmm. um, they can ring the doorbell. If someone's in, they may be able to come out and help them in the parking lot with whatever it is they need. Right. Or if no one is there, then there's a various numbers they can call, um, at least one of which is kind of a, a non-emergency. Like, I need to get a hold of somebody, but it's not yes. 911. Yeah, it's our di the dispatch number, so it's the, yeah. the business line at the dispatch call, center. So people would call the dispatch number. They might have to wait a bit um, in their car in the parking lot. For us to come back. Person, Judy, um, would circle back as at their, you know, the earliest point depending on what they're engaged in at the moment. Correct. Um, so it's probably better to call ahead to make an appointment. But if someone actually just happens to say, oh yeah, there's this thing I need to take care of over uh, with the police, and they just realize it because they saw the police station or, or, or something, then they might have to wait longer. But right. they could actually still be in touch with the police. It's just they're not really going to enter the building. That's kind of what right. I remember from that. It was like a two-page thing that we signed yeah. off on back in in March. March, correct. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it gives us gives us an opportunity. If you know if somebody's coming, then we can you know, take any precautions that we we may need to take. So we're not just mm -hmm. greeted with somebody that's not wearing a mask or something like that. We can let them know there's a sign posted on the door that they have to have to wear a mask and all that stuff as well. Okay. So. And that's just the general protocol across the board. Oops, sorry. I'm sorry, Joyce. I, I, I apologize. Okay, yeah, just one follow on. For, uh, so someone who calls makes an appointment might actually be able to come into the station you know, properly masked, et cetera. Or will yes. you generally take the appointments out in the 
in the parking lot as well. We we've done both. It depends on what the what the issue is. If they if they've got a if they've got a file report, we've been getting a a number of um, of reports of uh, unemployment fraud. So people will come in with paperwork and they want to sit down and go through the whole process and what they've done and who they've notified and all that stuff. So so we'll invite them into the station, um, okay. let them sit down and go through everything, take the report from them, and then we'll disinfect when when they leave. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. Sorry, I think I interrupted you, John. No, that's okay. I was just saying that that's. <clears throat> I think it's it's good protocol across the board. If 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 someone in town has business to do with any with any of our town employees, be it the highway garage or the police station or or town offices, call ahead. Let people be prepared um, to 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 maintain the safety of both the employee and the and the resident. And, and do it that way. So I, I think that, that what happens at the police station is is a great example of, of how we can maintain high delivery of service across town, but also keep people safe. Okay, okay. Uh, Keith, could you, what is your experience with people coming to visit you or talk to you? In most cases, um, they see the that we're there and they'll stop and I'll come out and talk to them. But I don't usually have people um, calling and making an appointment. It's usually, it's because they see us, you know, many during this time of hot days where the doors are wide open, we're trying to stay cool. Okay. Hey, Fred, if I, if I can, I'm gonna take this opportunity and, and I apologize for, for, for sounding like I'm on my bully pulpit a little bit, but I've seen a higher frequency of people across town, both employees and non-employees, and I'm not gonna call anybody out, of not wearing masks, of not practicing social distancing, of not doing the basic things that everyone has been clearly told will reduce the incidences of, of, of COVID. Um, just a reminder that we're, again, we're not out of the woods. We are heading into the fall season. Um, if, if you know wearing a mask, even even to get out of the car and, and fill your gas tank with gasoline, it's an easy thing to do. And if it prevents one person from getting COVID, how bad is that for your personal freedoms? So I just think that we need to 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 raise the standard of of paying attention to this so that we can we can lead by example because it's not going away it hasn't gone away um, and you know we have a county just south of us that was a yellow zone so you know let, let's I really am seeing it by employees um, conversations on ongoing conversations without masks town residents without masks it, it just and I'm not saying it's 100 percent but it's it's more and more frequent these days it seems i i share your your concern jonathan and, and i see the same thing happening in, in in town people not wearing masks or social distancing uh maybe because we don't we're not experiencing more incidents uh tests or or deaths or whatever uh in the town or or even franklin county but yeah, that's no reason that we shouldn't continue to observe these uh, safety measures that everybody says we should be doing. So, yeah. and I see, and I see a lot of, I see a lot of kids not wearing masks, a ton of them. I mean, that that's not wearing masks among teenagers is more common than wearing masks, it seems, and that's just a recipe for disaster. So I think that we should be leading by example and reminding people, hey, put your mask on; it's not that hard. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Do we have anything that, um, I mean, employees are the people we sort of have more influence over. Um, is there any, um, uh, for, for lack of a better word, punishment that an employee would receive for not wearing a mask when it's expected? Or do the people just get reprimanded with, without much consequence? I don't, know it, I don't know what a good consequence, what a good effective con uh, consequence might be, 
but I think um, maybe that's something we ought to think about if there's, um, you know, if we, we all have phones in our pockets pretty much. Uh, I, I don't walk around Waitley that much during the day, so I don't see it like Fred and John maybe do, but um, I see it down in Northampton and I just whip up my phone and take pictures of people walking on Smith campus without their masks or with their masks happening, their nose hanging out or their nose and their mouth hanging out. Like why bother? Um, and it may be that they're outdoors and they don't feel like they need to do it, but there's signs everywhere telling you that anywhere on Smith campus, indoors or outdoors, you need to wear a mask. And so I'm struggling with that same problem at work. Now they have much more control over the employees um, who you could certainly mention to their supervisor that you saw them without a mask or something like that. But the high school students who come through, people, there's I, I like five pictures just from today on College Lane of people not wearing masks when they're when they're asked to. And we don't have much leverage for people in, like in their own homes or people who are not our town employees. But the place where we do have some kind of leverage, maybe we should think about, you know, what it is we can do to really foster people doing the right thing. Well, and I say that not knowing what that thing we should do is, but maybe Brian's nodding his head, Keith is kind of nodding his head. Maybe you guys know a little bit better what kind of things might actually work. Well, I, one one thing that may come up, and and uh, right now we've got early early voting, and we're going to have uh, election day voting. Uh, how are we handling people that don't wear masks when they come in to vote? Are we not allowing them to vote, or are we clearing the room and just letting them be there? I guess right. Yeah, that I, I believe the same rules apply that that applied. Um, that at the previous town election is mm -hmm. it, there's some constitutional protections that that are pretty significant around voting in 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 how that interacts with mask orders is I yeah. don't I don't know that that's been challenged but I think I think Lynn's plan was that it, it and if somebody had a mm -hmm. let's say for instance someone had a legitimate medical reason not to have a mask on they would make special provisions for that person to to stay yeah. safe and vote. Okay, okay, this leads into our, our next item here of the status of the town's inventory of PPE and distribution to schools in the upcoming year. Brian, I think you shared with us a table of what we have, what's, a, what's available. Um, yeah, we've been How keeping... That, that. <clears throat> We've been keeping track of, well, when this first started and supplies were very scarce, we started trying to keep track of, very good track of all our supplies and PPE. Um, recently, I don't know, Jim may know the timing better than I, but it was probably three or four weeks ago. Um, we got a shipment from MEMA of, of over 6,000 surgical masks and 6,000 KN95 masks. Um, and again, I think Jim can comment better on how quickly we're using this kind of stuff because he's the he's the keeper of the PPE at this point. Um, and and then I also got a um, an email from Darius wondering if um, the town would either sell or donate um, some of the KN95 masks to um, to the schools. So. Um, <clears throat> shouldn't and Jim you look like you're about to talk and I don't want to because you know more than I do about this but shame on us if we're not doing everything we can to help the schools out as they're struggling with and working really really hard to figure out how to open and keeping kids and staff and 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 faculty safe and you know we should be doing anything possible to help the schools out because that's going to be you know, I, what, what can we do? I, I have 
reached out to the principal of the elementary school. I have not heard back from her yet um, as to what their needs might be. Um, I, I can just throw out a number, but I, I just, I don't know what their needs are. You know, if they have 30 staff members and they're going to assign, you know, they're going to make them wear KN95 masks and they can wear a mask, one mask per week. You know, if we give them a thousand masks, they should be good for the year. Um, I'm not sure what, what their requirements are going to be, if they're going to have to change a new mask every day, or what they think they might need for supplies. I can tell you that as far as the town goes, um, from a police perspective, we're probably the ones using the most supplies right now because we're still at the beginning of every shift, we're still cleaning the cruiser, we're still cleaning the station twice a week, disinfecting. Everybody's wearing masks, we're switching out masks. Um, we've got oh, surgical I masks, KN95 masks, cotton masks, we've got all kinds of stuff that we've, we've been using. Yeah. Could you, sorry Jim, could you say how often um, does an officer change masks? You suggested once per week for an employee at the school, how often does a police officer change out their mask? Uh, I would probably say on a regular basis about the same, about the same thing, um, unless <clears throat> unless there's a situation that comes up, unless mm -hmm. we have to help out at a medical call. Um, like yesterday, I just um, I just took a mask out of my um, out of the a brand new mask, put the mask on, went to a medical call, um, had to do CPR. I immediately threw that mask away when I was done with it because I didn't I didn't want any part of the mask. So that mask got one use. Because we, we don't know what, why the person, what happened to them. So um, whether mm -hmm. they're sick or not, I don't know. I just, I didn't want to take a chance. Um, if we have to deal with somebody face-to-face, -face, close contact, you know, they, they, may, they may use a surgical mask and then, you know, dispose of that surgical mask after one or two uses. There's really nothing in our policy that says that you should wear, you know, this mm -hmm. mask for one week. It's, it's kind of what their, what their comfort level is. I have told um, one or two officers that, hey, you need to switch it out because you've had the same, you can tell it's the same mask, it's dirty. It's, you gotta, you gotta, there's plenty of them, so put a new mask on. Um, Jim, do we, Jim, do we have, and I, I apologize for not remembering what the number you quoted was, do we have a thousand masks to deliver to the schools? Uh, well, currently, so we have we have three different or two different supplies. We have a supply that's available for, you know, if Keith needs masks, I can just go and grab grab a box of masks and give him masks. That's that's not an issue. And then we have a what we're calling the EOC supplies. That's kind of our stockpile that we want to try to keep that as much as we can in case something big happens. Um, so we're trying to keep the you know the stockpile there, if you will. So we had it split up evenly. We had the same amount in supply as we'd had for, um, for the EOC supplies. But with this new shipment that came in, um, that puts us at about, so for surgical masks, we're at about 6,500 and 6,400 total masks for, um, for both the supply and the EOC. So that's the total number of masks that we have for the entire town. Um, we've used, I think, I kind of looked at it quick. I didn't do like exact numbers, but between our officers, I'm not sure the fire department, I know they've used some because they've had a, a couple of calls that they've used them on. Um, but we're probably up in the 100, 150 range for how many masks we've used since the beginning of this, um, this situation. Some officers don't work all the time, so they've had the same mask for a while. I got to say, I mean, I'm just speaking for myself. I think that we should drop off a thousand masks to the school tomorrow, say, here you go. Don't hesitate to, to call us. And I, I, you know, this is a big deal coming up when they open school. And oh, yeah. we sh I don't think we should wait around. I think we should just yeah. say, here you go and, and, and be ready for, to do whatever it takes. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, if, if this spikes up again, I mean, there's there's always time to, to replenish it. I mean, with 6,000 masks, if we wanted to order 1,000 more, it might take us a while to come to it. I, I think just, if it were me, I'd say drop it off tomorrow. Here yeah. you go. Is it easy to replenish these if you run short in the next couple of months? 
well, uh, it's not it's not difficult to to get them. It's not like it was at the beginning where you just can't get it. It may take us a month to to resupply. Um, I know MEMA and you know the supplies that we were getting for free. Those haven't been coming in to us. They gave us this last order. They said these 6,200 masks should last you guys for a long time. So we're not doing anything else right now. They are taking orders through the FERCOG. They we still have a supply chain where we can get stuff from if we need to. Um, but it, it, like I said, it may take a few weeks to to get it. But it, you know, if we know that we have to use 2,000 masks, we we may want to think about you know starting to replenish some of that. Yeah, because I mean, again, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but the the teachers and the and the principal and the other people at the school are just as much town employees as anyone else and and we should yeah. be delivering them these masks right away just like if keith needed them for his staff or you yeah. did for your staff jim they'd have them we should be just doing this automatically and not waiting cuz 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 the principal has a tremendous amount of stuff to think about yeah. in addition to this and I know I know they've had some volunteers, parents, and senior centers. They've been making you know handmade masks and donating those. So I don't I don't I just didn't know what their preference was. You know maybe uh, yeah. at this point maybe teachers have their own masks that they want to wear and they don't want to wear a KN95 mask. But maybe they want to wear their own designer mask. Let's deliver. I mean, my yeah. I would suggest a formal yeah. suggestion that we deliver a thousand masks tomorrow and then they can store them so they don't have to think about it they don't have to worry about it we should just do it now would you because we have we have about the same amount of surgical masks as we do kn95 masks um the kn95 masks that we have and i think you guys probably remember back to when we got our initial shipment <laughs> and they tested them and we got the test results and not one of the nine different masks tested where they where they were supposed to the highest rating that we had was 80%, they're supposed to be 95%, but the highest of the ad was, I think, 82%. These new masks haven't been tested. So I'm not sure the quality of these masks. I can't find anything that has you know, the specific masks that we have. I can tell you that they have nothing but Chinese characters on them. So they are masks that came from China. So yeah, whether not. they're the 20% masks or whether they're 60% masks, I, I don't know the quality of them. So if we're giving somebody a KN95 mask and expecting them to get the, the protection of a KN95 mask, knowing that it's not going to provide that protection, you know, I think we kind of need to, to let them know that this, you know, if, if the well, school nurse has to deal with somebody that may be sick, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust one of these masks, so to speak. You know, we, we have well, some of short supply that have been tested higher. Well, sure, full disclosure on all of that. I think yeah. everyone should be skeptical. Yeah. But I think- The whole thing was that the surgical masks are probably the same quality. So, I mean, we, if we give I, 500 I, of each or- If they could, or a thousand of each. Yeah. For that matter. Um, I mean, these are, uh, we, if we send over uh, 500 of each right now and say, let us know yeah. when you need more. Your, your number of, I was gonna ask about two numbers. One was of a person working full time using just one mask per week makes sense in the in the world where you can't get these masks readily. Um, and you said 150 since March. Now that 150 is like for for like a, a full time person may have used 150 in the since March time, which makes I mean, it's not been 150 weeks, but that's maybe more like twice a week, maybe, because you were saying there were situations in which you might toss a mask. So I'm, I just want to make sure I've kind of got the numbers right. I can't imagine a teacher working full time and, you know, not really wanting to dispose of that mask at the end of the day. And I know I think one of our grants we're putting in, we might be able to get some money for some UV uh, De disinfectants so that, that seemed to work on those masks but I, I just thought I'd ask about those numbers yeah and, and like I said some some officers some of our officers have gotten they've gotten their own masks they've they've got not I don't want to call them designer masks but they're you know it may be a 
you know, a scarf yeah. that they pull up over their face. And if they're not going to a medical call and they're just on the side of the road, they can pull that up quick. Or they, yeah, you know, they, they have just a cotton mask that, that somebody made them. Maybe their wife made it for them or something. So there's a lot of that too. They're using their own mask. I'm just yeah. saying what, what we've used so far. And I think we're at the okay. point now yes, where everybody's kind of making their own stuff. Right. So I, I want a little more details is what I'm trying to ask. You say, we've used 150. Can you, like, how many people is that spread among over how much time? Roughly? Well, just, just looking at the basic numbers of what, so I have a, a sheet that, um, that keeps track of the inventory. And then when we issue um, PPE to a town department, that's, that's documented on the sheet. So we've gone through, so from what I can see, we've given the police department from our supplies, we've given the police department at least 150 masks. Okay. So, so that's we re resupplied 150 masks. It's the police department over the past uh, not quite six months. Yeah. Okay. And then other department, you, you could probably make a chart. I don't actually want you to make a chart of I have okay. I have all the information of who who we've given what yeah we've gave we gave oh. 50 masks to the transfer station, um, we've given hand sanitizer we've given masks right. to the fire it's department almost, hundreds of masks to the fire department yeah. scaled to man hours I would imagine transfer station, and police usage I mean excluding people with their own masks I suppose, um, that's what we might expect the school to need, mm -hmm. so it uh, but. Um, I know you'll hear back from the principal and yeah. I think um, I would, I would agree with John that we should be as generous as we possibly can. Um, I know I'm getting ready to teach <laughs> in another week. Um, and this is going to be really hard. And I, uh, if we can help them out by sending over some PPE, so at least they don't have to worry about that till November or December, and then they know they can come back. Um, to ask for more, I think that's not an unreasonable at all thing for us to do. And if it happens tomorrow or the day after, I'm, I guess I'm okay with either of those. And, and not wait for and not wait for the request; just deliver it. Yeah. Um, I would also say, Jim, one of the things that that I gave me pause when you talked about people using their own stuff. Um, I, I think it's pretty clear that the gator masks are not as effective as regular masks. So I do not believe that we should, as a town, consider the gator covers, whatever they're called, as fulfilling our requirement for town employees to wear protective gear, because it, it's, it's very clear that those are not as effective. Yeah. And, and I mean, the, time, the times they would wear those would be, you know, if they if they stop to get a, a coffee at Dunkin' Donuts or something like that, they, they may just throw that on to go in and get it quick. Yeah, but they're, they're certainly not going to use it on a call. That's for sure. Right. But Jim, under the con yeah, no, I hear you. under the category of leadership. Yeah. Why? If, if they're working for the town, they should not be seen with a gator mask on because it's sending the wrong signal. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree, and we've we've issued we've issued masks, K N ninety five masks, surgical masks. We've issued them to them, and again, I don't I don't follow them around like a puppy dog, watching every step that they make. But if I do see somebody doing that, wearing an inappropriate mask, I'm, I'll be sure to uh, to remind them that we have the appropriate PPE to wear. Well, I I think front, I think our board of health said something to the. To the school committee, the elementary or frontier, of what kind of mass would be acceptable. So, if they're saying that, I think that should apply to the uh, town employees as well. And the other thing I like to say is, if we're giving these to the school, I have no problem, but to make them understand that it's for the employees and not to hand out to every student that comes in the door the first day. Now, yes, I don't. If there are some students that don't have it or forgot it, yes, but not to hand it out to every student every day they come through the door because that only lasts a week or two. Hmm. So I guess you need to somehow tell them that uh, it's for employees and not everybody that's in the building. And for the majority of the kids, it, it wouldn't, they wouldn't be properly sized anyways. Well, they'd, they'd be too big for them. They wouldn't be appropriate masks to, to wear. Okay. 
Okay, so we agreeing that uh, we will deliver a thousand to the school. That what Jim would do this? I'll drop it off tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, we agree, with Jonathan or Joyce. Okay, okay, fine with me. Okay, Brian, is that fine with you? Yeah, do you want to do a thousand surgical and a thousand KN95? Sounds like we got them. If we got them, a thousand of each. Yeah, well, it's not like we're flying. If we're flying through the things, right? And we have we have given. I've given. Uh, I think they're. I'm trying to remember if they're. I think they're boxes of a hundred. So we gave four boxes of gloves to the to the uh, custodian. Gave him some gloves and. I have to look at the sheet, but I think gloves and maybe some cleaner or disinfectant because they he was having a hard time getting some supplies in, so we gave him some stuff to hold over as far as gloves because he didn't have any rubber gloves left. So we gave them gave him some gloves as well. So um, it's not a problem for me to just get a hold of him and I'll drop them off to him. Yeah, I think I just I just want to be clear that I've been in touch with with Chrissy on multiple occasions and said. Pretty much our stuff is your stuff for the elementary school and let us know what you need. Um, yeah. So well, because they're not in session right now, there, there really hasn't been many requests, but I'm sure they'll probably increase if, if they can't. Oh, yeah. If they're not we're able to get things, needed. every school district in the state is now trying to procure the same item. So mm -hmm. let's, hope, let's hope the supply chain can uh, hold out. And I think, I mean, that, for 2,000 masks, that, that would be a pretty hefty price tag as well, just, just to get started. I mean, you're looking at hundreds of dollars worth of, worth of masks that we didn't, we didn't have to pay for from the town's budget. So, yep. so absolutely, we should be helping them out. Okay. Hey, let's, okay. let's move on the agenda. Uh, next item is discuss applying for the Maya Risk Management Risk Mitigation Grant. Uh, UV lights for the HVAC system at the elementary school and town offices. Brian? Yeah, so each year, Maya, the town's insurance company, puts out um, what they call a risk mitigation grant. Uh, it's up to $10,000. And I got an email from uh, Shelly Pareda, who's the business manager for the school. And they received quotes from their HVAC um, service provider um, and I think I provided that in your packet um, to put in, um, I think what are called UVC um, lights in the air handling units. Um, UVC, as I had to read up on it, is a disinfectant. It can, it can disinfect and it can kill viruses. Um, so um, that's a possibility we could um, submit this grant application um, to purchase those. In the meantime, um, I sent an email to the Board of Health asking what their what their take on these on these units were. Um, and I was on a couple emails from Fran Fortino um, to Department of Labor Standards, and then um, they referred him to um, DPH and then to uh, DESI. And the last email I was on was that he was waiting to hear back from the, the DESI HVAC guy. I don't know. I didn't even know they had one. Um, but I think it's worth knowing that these would actually work in the systems that, that, that we have. Um, I, I don't think we want to invest five grand and to put nice colored lights in our air, air handler units if they're not really going to do the job. Um, I guess if, I mean, this would likely be eligible for CARES Act money as well, if we didn't want to use the grant. Um, so so it, I don't know that, I mean, I, I'd like to hear back from Fran first before sort of jumping into this with both feet. Um, but I wanted to just get, get your sense of whether you thought it was a good idea or not. And possibly, if it is if it is extremely effective, then it might be something that we might want to consider for the town offices as well. Are are we still looking at buying the uh, the uh, remote uh, air handlers uh, 
what I want to say, medical grade uh, air filters? <clears throat> we have two of those now, yep. You have two of them? Where are they going to be used? Well, right now they're in the early voting room in the large conference room. Okay, and they'll be in the, the town hall for election days? Next Tuesday, yep. Hmm. Those are the portable units, but you're, um, portable units. you're thinking if these UV things prove to work well, they could be on the the main system for the town offices as well. Right. Well, okay. we'll see what Fran has to say. Yeah. Uh, but I think, again, under the category of we should do whatever is, is credible. Um, and if these are credibly um, verified that, that they are effective in, in killing germs, then let's do it. Brian, when you <clears throat> when you say town offices, are you talking a town office building or town buildings in general? Um, I mean, would that town office building because okay. the 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 units that they're looking at would be installed inside the air handling system. Okay. So it would need a central uh, a central air handling unit. Yeah, I was just wondering because we have the HVAC system here at the police station as well. So I didn't know if that's something that we should consider. I know which employees are more important, the police? <laughs> yeah. or, yeah, Jim, I think you just, you know, stack up on those masks for you guys. Yeah, yeah you guys got the masks. We're going to, we, we take masks to all the vents in the building. <laughs> Good then. That's thinking. You take a fan, put an N90, put a HEPA filter mm. in the back of it. Mm, duct tape it to the back of it and it'll filter the air for you. It, and as a backup, Jim, you can use the hydrochlor, what I can't even pronounce it, uh, <laughs> just for, you know, for safety's sake and just ingest that and you'll be set. Little little chlorine. Yeah, the, yeah, we spray each other when we start our shifts, we just spray each other with bleach. And... Good. Good. There, yeah. you go. there you go. But, but seriously, if there's... Yeah, please. We're, we're joking right now. Yeah. If there's something for, if there's something that that might work there in terms of making the air better. Yeah, no, we just have the There's regular HEPA unit. Yeah, we just have the regular HEPA filter for the mm -hmm. you know, the system. But other than that, there's yeah. there's nothing else. Yeah. Well, the upgraded HEPA filters are also um, something that can make an existing system more effective. And mm -hmm. it might be that for your system that's a better option than UV, but we won't know until we look into it. And maybe the schools are looking at this. Yeah. Okay, let's move on the agenda. We, we're only about halfway through and it's, uh, we'll be here for another hour yet, maybe. I can talk fast. Uh, all, all business, uh, discuss in general terms, possible conditions to include in the request for information for the center school uh remodeling especially uh reference to the the milk bottle i guess we've we've got uh letters from the historical commission and historical society asking that the town retain the milk bottle and access to the to the milk bottle uh once we decide uh what's happening with the with the center school whether it's going to be mm -hmm sold or whatever that uh, these two committees uh, want to continue using the milk bottle like it has in the past so I think that's that's something that will definitely be be considered when we get to that point of deciding who and how and what what to happen with the with the center school uh, and I see we've got members of the historic commission here, uh, Judy, did you want to say something else? No, I think I think we've submitted our request. The society submitted a request for the milk bottle, and the historical commission submitted a separate request about preserving the facade. Right. The, the exterior. Right. And I personally don't think we've heard anything from this group that's contrary to those sentiments. I, I think that that would be the, the goal. Because again, if you change the facade, you change the, <clears throat> the overall uh, look and feel of the town. And if you 
remove the milk bottle, you're doing the same thing. So you're defeating the purpose of preserving the building to begin with. So yeah. I, personally, I don't think it's, it's, it's something that anyone here disagrees with at all in terms but of the rule. The, the only thing that, that may affect the, the, not the facade, but the look at a building, if there's a need for a handicapped uh, well, that, that ramp was, or, or an elevator or, or stair or wherever, where would that, would that go? We, I guess we well, could that's, that that's be inside, inside the building or uh, in a place that's not visible from the front of the building. I guess that's still an option that we can I discuss. think the, the Historical Commission would understand the zoning says you can't change the exterior footprint except for accessibility and I'm sure the Historical Commission would agree with that. Okay. Good. Brian, is there anything else that needs to be discussed on that or are we good? Uh, um, no, I, it, it was good to differentiate between the two requests. One was for really for an easement for the milk bottle to stay where it is. Um, an easement will be necessary if the town were to sell that property. If the town were to maintain ownership of the property, then an easement's not as critical. Um, maybe there might want to be one between the historical society and the town. I'm not sure. Um, and then the other, the other letter, well, one of the other letters, there's uh, three letters total, um, was more about the, um, the facade and protecting the facade. So it's really, really two different requests there, but. Okay, we, are we done discussing this item for now? I think so. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I mean, um, we'll, we'll discuss it more in detail when, yeah. when we talk about uh, the details of the RFI. Um, but if that's, the, if that's kind yeah. of what everybody's thinking, it would be helpful to know. Right, okay. okay. Yeah. Moving on agenda, the next item is to review and vote to adopt a policy on the timing of payments for police details. Okay, I think Brian, you shared with us a, a policy that you you developed. Uh, it was quite detailed and specific. Uh, I don't know if you want to pull that up or or not. Or um, it's up to it's up to you guys. I, I I read it. I don't need to see it again unless somebody else wants to see it again. Yeah, but it is sort of a public meeting. So public yeah. meeting, okay. Public won't have That's I true. Notes we got in advance, so maybe that would not be a bad idea. The only the only comment I, I had, I, I, and, I, and I don't know whether this is true for other, we call it revolving funds, to get a year-end report or periodic report on on how it's doing, how the account is doing, whether it's uh, managing the money that's in there or or short or, or excess, whatever, I guess. And maybe that will happen anyway when we get into budget season next year, so. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get real-time reports um, yeah. every time that the, um, that the account issues the, the reports after the warrants are signed. All right. Okay. <clears throat> I'm I'm fine with it, with it. Okay. While we're waiting, Jim, did you want to say any more? Do you have any concern with what Brian put together? I took forever. <clears throat> Jim, you're muted. You we don't hear you. Sorry, I forgot I muted myself. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I 99% of what what's in there is we're already doing anyways. Um, the only the other percentage that's remaining is um, I'm probably going to be meeting with Dara on Monday just so she can see what what I have for record keeping on my end and to see if there's something else she wants to add or something we don't need to do. Um, but other than that, all of the information that's in the, the policy that was um, drafted by Brian, that's, like I said, it's pretty much what we're doing now, and I have absolutely no no problem with it at all. And, and Jim, 
there's there's nothing to be concerned about in terms of if if the frequency of detail officers has a significant uptick that doesn't impact this at all i mean is this is this written for the for the status quo but if if you saw a, a dramatic increase in need would that impact this this policy uh i i don't think i mean it wouldn't impact anything that that i do i mean i, I think it would probably go back to the to the town if there was you know a time that came where we had to you know, redo five and 10 again, and they need 10 police officers every day for 10 hours a day, then we're going to be looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of details. Um, right. That's sort of my point. Yeah. And then we come into a cash flow issue. Well, yeah. the, the other, the other, in, the other case would be uh, when Castaways uh, opens up again, I guess you have detailed police there, right? Yeah. Yeah. We have detailed police there and there. I mean, it was, it was hit or miss. Um, I'd say when it when they first started, they were giving us um, the detail check the following week, and then that you know as things kind of got a little strange there with closing and opening and the time frames, you know that that switched to probably you know three weeks to a month. Um, but they were pretty regular um, when they were fully operating. They were pretty regular on getting the the checks to us on a regular basis. So. Um, if if we're getting the checks within 30 days, we shouldn't we shouldn't have an issue. I mean, if we did ten thousand dollars worth of details and 30 days from now we've got all those checks in, you know, it it should it should be okay. But it's not going to change what's already happening with the account. It's already you know it already runs in a deficit. I just got a the the latest report. It was it was only three hundred and fourteen dollars that that was in a deficit that we don't we're not sure why it's in a deficit of $314. Um, so Dar is looking into that a little bit more because it, as far as I'm concerned, it shouldn't be in a deficit at all because I don't spend any money out of it until I turn the check over. So that's, that's how we've been doing it. So moving forward, I don't think we're going to really get a good judge of it until we start actually going through the process. So, Okay, so do we need to decide on a dollar amount to put into this account? No, we're not asking that that the that the account um, have any any seed money placed into it. Um, the account the account can run deficit um, until um, at the end of the fiscal year. It needs to be trued up by the end of September. So we're not losing any any interest income even with this policy, correct? Right. And so long as someone pays within two months, it's not a problem for the books. Right. Um, and and I don't think it lists what we what actions we take if people are delinquent by more than that period of time. Well, the the only the only thing that's in there is the uh, the ten dollar late fee that gets added after thirty right. days. Right, and that would cover any any yeah okay all right. And it's Re resending out a you know another invoice or something like that. I mean, it's not a I don't think it's a revenue thing at all, and uh, I I can't think off the top of my head of anybody that's actually paid the ten dollar late fee. So, and it's written, it's written so that in 12 months we would, we would reassess whether the policy is working or not. Um, and really the whole goal here was that if we're going to switch the, the timing of the payment, we needed to identify um, responsibilities, the record keeping and a, a process for, for how we're going to communicate between Jim and the treasurer, Lynn, and the payroll clerk, Janet and Dara. Um, so we just wanted to make sure that was very clear as to how we were going to do that because the town is, mm -hmm. the, the risk of non-payment is being shifted to the town. So we wanted to be very careful as to, as to how we were going to deal with that. Okay. And so this applies only to uh, Waitley, uh, police officers working in Waitley. No. No, this, it, it would apply to any Waitley police officer doing a detail anywhere. 
if he, okay. if he's it's the same process, whether it's in town or whether it's out of town, the checks are going to be coming from the, the vendor. So if we do a detail for Hatfield, yeah. we're still billing the vendor. Hatfield has nothing to do with it. It has nothing to do with the town specifically. Okay. It's the town where the officers from, not the town where the work happens. Correct. Oh, okay. And then Jim, and again, I don't want to dwell on this, but since it work that's being performed in another town, we have literally zero control over their collections. Or is it our collections? So the it's, town can get involved. It's the same process. It's the same process because we're billing the vendor directly. We're not, if we did a detail in Deerfield, it has absolutely nothing to do with Deerfield other than the fact that that's where the location of the detail is. Okay. Right. We're still we're still billing. We're still collecting the ten percent administrative fee. We're still all all that still applies to us. Okay. Okay. I'm yeah. sorry. Thanks. No, nope, that's okay. Okay, so it's only Waitley officers, regardless of where they're working, I guess. So yeah. Correct. Yeah, we yes. don't we don't pay any other officers. Right. Even if we did a highway department job or something like that, it's it's at the it's at a different rate, but it's still you know Keith would Keith would pay it out of his his budget for the for the officer that's doing the detail. So okay. even if it's a town detail, it doesn't doesn't change anything really. Okay. We need a motion and a vote on this. Yes, please. Make a Thank motion you. to adopt the policy. A second. A motion. Okay, all those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Jonathan? Yeah. Fred, yes. Hey, hey Fred, um I, I think Jim wanted to talk quickly about um, manpower. Yes, if I could I'll just take a couple of minutes because this it's a good segue into this because we have um, officers that have been hired full time by other departments that their commitment is now with those departments. And so we're kind of in the process right now of, of being shorthanded um, as far as filling shifts and being able to do town details and things like that. So um, so basically what I'm looking for is to um, get the okay from you guys to, to start the process to hopefully hire um, two people, two part-time officers. Um, this isn't, again, it's not additional officers, it's replacing officers that were, we've either lost or are losing. Mm -hmm. so. Um, I'm not looking for additional money. I'm not for additional funding, anything like that. The training that we, the training budget that we have, we're going to be again this year doing some most of our training online because of the coronavirus. So, um, so we should have money to train these officers with with no issues, and it, it won't be any additional funding that that is going to be required to do this. So, so, so I'm like responsible. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, Fred. How many? Uh, uh, officers do you have now? So, so currently there's, so there's two full-time officers. We have eight part-time officers on a regular roster. Yeah. And then we have two people that are kind of, we consider them reserve officers. It's Randy Williams and Ed Zineski. Um, they don't really work shifts, so to speak, but uh, they're still Waitley police officers. So they're eligible for working details. Um, but they don't they don't work shifts, so they're not card counted as part of our our regular roster. So our regular roster at at ten people is going to be going down probably to um, eight people. So we're going to need to kind of fill those slots. We're having you know running into difficulties filling shifts, and I, I had an email going back and forth with Lynn today. I think Brian was part of the email as well. We've got one officer that's. He's really he's stepping up and he's taking a lot of a lot of the open shifts, um, but it's it's kind of putting us in a position where he's he he may be working too many hours, um, so he's consistently working forty hours per pay period or uh, or more, which that kind of opens us up to we should be offering him uh, benefits and things like that. So we that's kind of the other part of it is to. And to keep keep his hours down as well, so we don't want him working three three or four shifts a, every week. Um, right. We get more people than those those people can fill those open shifts as well. So, so well, we I don't think this is controversial. I think we should 
do that. They'd be irresponsible not to, and for all the reasons you say. Yeah, I agree. Okay, I, I don't have a problem hiring the, the people that uh, to replace who's leaving, as long as you don't go more than uh, what, 10 people you say, 10 officers you have on staff, so. Yeah, so the, the number of officers, I mean, we could have 20 people on staff. We're, we're budgeted for a certain number of shifts. So if I have 20 people, 10 people, 30 people, it doesn't matter because we only have a certain number of shifts anyways. So it's not like having 20 people on is going to cost more in my budget. Well, you've got, training, you've got training exercises and other things that could be involved in. I don't know all the details of what they do. Yep. But I mean, that's additional expense to carry more than, say, the 10. Yeah, no, 10, 10's always been our regular roster, but it's never, like I said, we have we have two or three people on a on a reserve roster as well. So, I mean, to go over one or two, I don't I don't know that it should be a, a policy that we can't have more than 10 people on the, the regular roster. I don't know that that would be a, a benefit one way or another. Mm -hmm. It probably doesn't need to be 20. Yeah, no, I just threw 20 out as a, yeah. as just a number because mm -hmm. we're only budgeted for a certain number of shifts anyway, so. So it doesn't really, doesn't really matter. If we have 20 people working one shift a month, we've got 20 shifts available versus three people working seven shifts a month. Yeah, the only thing I would mention about that is obviously we, 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 we want to always strive for consistency of, of officers that people see and interact with. I mean, you have a more effective police force if, you, if the people are seeing the same people over and over again rather than seeing one person once every five months. Trust me, I agree. That's why, that's why I was looking for, you know, the full-time position to, to fill some of these gaps and deal with some of that stuff instead of having more officers doing one shift occasionally here and there. That doesn't help me much. So I agree with you. <clears throat> and just, just a, a side note from that, I do have um, a couple of resumes already that people have just dropped off. Um, you know, occasionally they, they'll just mail in an application or drop off a resume. I do have one potential person who was, we sponsored to go to the academy, which is basically just a, a signature. He went to the academy. It didn't cost the town anything. They just, you just need to have somebody sign off on it. Um, so he's already, he's been to the academy. Um, he's been vetted by me because I won't sponsor somebody that I wouldn't hire to begin with. So he's now done with the part-time academy. So it's a, possibly a good opportunity for, for me to, um, to bring somebody in and get them trained up. But I'd also be looking for somebody with a, a little bit of experience as well um, so we can get them started sooner rather than later. So, okay. just so you know, does, does this board need to uh, take any action or, or approve the officers that he's hiring? You appoint the appointing you, authority. You, yeah, you appoint the officers. We appoint the officers. Okay, so he would come to the board with the names of who he wants to point in uh, in the past yeah that's jim has 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 conducted the interviews process and presented names with resumes as to people that he would recommend be appointed um because he, i don't know much about policing so um i think we've relied on on his opinion and expertise as to who who would work out the best okay so all we needed tell him now, I guess, is to go ahead and and, uh, and uh, find some candidates that you want to hire and bring them to the board at a future meeting. Good luck. Thank okay. you. <laughs> okay. Okay, moving on. Other old business. Uh, we have an item that keeps getting pushed back, I guess, is that... I'm if we want to push it back again, that's fine. It's really not pressing at all. Yeah. Um, okay. Priority project list. Okay. Uh, new business. Okay. Discuss designated town representative to execute change orders for the Williamsburg Road bridge replacement and Chestnut Plain Road complete streets projects to consider any change orders for these projects. I would yep. suggest, and I honestly don't know who that is, but I would suggest that it be the liaison to the highway department. Well, I, that's one option. I, I think uh, Brian is suggesting that Keith, I, I guess, do that with, with a dollar limit 
of what he can he can approve without going to the board. If if that's allowed, that's great. I just didn't think that was allowed, but it, sure. Yeah, well, you can I, authorize you can authorize somebody to to execute change orders. A staff person who's responsible for the 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 administration of the work, even. Yep. Fine. <coughs> Okay, I, I guess that's what we're hearing from Brian, uh, and I guess maybe we should ask Keith, is that acceptable to him to, to be in his position to do that? Yeah, I can, I can work within that limit that you authorize, and just to, like in re this situation, any of the change orders are being reviewed and recommended by the engineer anyways. Um, so the um, tie and bond is reviewing it and making sure that it, everything is in order anyway. So it, it's just that they can't execute the the order without the town doing it, but they recommend it to us before we would do it. Right. And to me, it makes sense because Keith is overseeing other people doing work in our town. He'll be the most knowledgeable person to be able to interpret and make a judgment. So I'm really fine with yep. uh, what Brian had proposed up to 10K. Let uh, Keith sign off over 10K. Maybe we have to have a little more discussion. Okay. And, and this would be, Brian, this would be, you would also sign off on him? No, <clears throat> I would not need to sign off on him. Um, it would just be I Keith. Would, yeah, I mean, I would review them. I'd like to review them still. Um, should we have should we have a policy where anything over 10k needs an additional person? I mean, we don't want to slow the process down coming to this board every time. Yeah. Uh, if, if keep if keep thinks it should happen, um, but it's over the 10k limit, just have a second person approving it. And who's the liaison to the highway department then? No idea. Well, uh, I'm, I'm trying I to think. Know. I think I'd have to look it up. You know, I'm trying to think, Brian, what we did with the, with the town hall, you know, you and I both approved the change orders. And I don't remember if we had a dollar limit. There wasn't really any that were, I don't think, over 10,000. Yeah, I think you were authorized, Fred, over um, under ten thousand to execute change orders. Right, but I, I don't mean, think I had to sign them. Yeah, there wasn't any all over that amount, and however that frequency of that happens, I, I, I don't know on these two these two projects. Uh, I think we've seen one already. For is it the Williamsburg Bridge? It's over. It's over ten thousand already. Yep. A change order order for that one. Mm -hmm. uh, for the complete streets one, I, I well, that's an awful lot of, of work that would cost more than ten thousand dollars for that kind of project. Yeah, the ten thousand is kind of it's kind of arbitrary. Um, yeah. The the idea is that we don't want a five dollar change order no. if it needs to be done right away to to take a week to get executed um, yeah. or, or even forty eight hours. But we also don't want to. Twenty twenty five thousand dollar change order without really the board having a say as to whether that's wise or not. Yeah. Right. So I guess I would make a motion that we that we authorize Keith to uh, approve the change orders for the Williamsburg Road and Chestnut Plain Road projects up to a limit of ten thousand dollars. And anything over that would come back to the, the board for review and authorization. I would second that. Okay. Uh, roll call vote. Joyce? Aye. Jonathan? Fine. Fred, yes. Okay. Okay, moving on. New business discuss signs on public property and public rights of way. So Fred, because because you because you guys have made that motion, you created more work for yourselves. Um, 
Oh. So in the packet, you have a, a change proposed change order number one that Keith can probably talk a little bit more about. It was a trap. It was oh, a trap. Okay, well, we're here. We can talk about it. That's A11, I guess, huh? <laughs> yeah, I can tell you a little bit about what that change order is, and that is in regards to the the bridge components that have been stockpiled in Deerfield for years. There was some of the deck panels that's basically the the, the wearing surface of the vehicle with the vehicles we driving over were in poor condition, and since we had money allocated to in the original contract to purchase extra components we felt that we should use that money and then also get some extra panels and this will also give us the ability to have some extra panels in inventory should any of them get damaged at a later time and we would be able to replace the panel without having to order and go back to the manufacturer. So um, that's why this one change order is kind of large. Hopefully we won't be looking at any other change orders, period, I'm hoping. Um, certainly I can't anticipate anything else exceeding the 10th, this kind of money, so. Hmm. Did this would apply to, to both bridges? Yeah, that would be better. They, these panels, everything's gonna be, interchangeable the panels from one bridge to another yes okay and how many extra would you be getting then uh, i believe i'm gonna have um five or six extras which each section is a, um a five foot panel five feet in width or in length okay and that's that's what you feel is sufficient for i guess the near future that should take care of us Correct. Well, how often do these panels fail? I mean, it's I, I don't. I don't think they'll necessarily fail. It's just that the um, surface rust. Um, one of the things that I don't know is what type of um, winter chemicals were being used on them in the previous location. Um, in our situation on the gravel road, it's not going to be treated with salt. So, I I don't see any. Um, reason why they will be failing anytime soon. They can always be taken out, sandblasted, and 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 re retreated, recoded. Mm -hmm. um, where would we store them so that they would not have uh, you know environmental damage over time? Well, I, I mean, my recommendation at the moment is I would probably store them at the um, at the old stump dump. Outside? Like outside? I mean, it sounds like yeah. I mean, the problem it's, is that some things we were going to get from a place in Deerfield uh, are in poor condition. It might be because they're stored outside in the rain. So don't. I, I don't think it's the rain. It's I think it's um, road chemicals, salt that have deteriorated them. And these are panels that were not in use, and they still got. So they, they were in use. Uh huh. And. Okay. When they were previously used, the chemicals have taken yeah. their effect. What about storing them in, didn't we just buy a, like a trailer truck size? Yeah, the, the storage box, but these are, these panels are not, they're going to be five feet by 12 feet. Um, I'm not saying that they couldn't, but it's certainly, um, I would probably say to you that if, if I felt they need to be covered, I would prefer that I um, put some type of a, a, a tarp type of material over it to keep them out of the elements. Hmm. Can they be How often do you need to replace that kind of a... Chances are we may not ever need to do them, but there also is a possibility um, for instance, it's a possibility a snow plow could catch and do some damage to one of them. It's just a, it's just good for us to have a few extra in inventory so that if one does get damaged, they just get unbolted um, and replaced. 
and that way it could be done without having to close the road for any length of time. Wait, it, it sounded like, how many did you, did you say we would be getting extra? Uh, I, I believe it's six. Six. Can these be stored in that yellow bar? They could, yes. That's another option. Yeah. Hmm. I think, I think we just let Keith, personally, I'll, I would let Keith use his best judgment. Okay. I don't know why we're micromanaging this. No, I, well, no, I just, mainly had questions because it's just, it seemed uh, an odd thing. Like, do we build a new bridge and like it's made of breakable, replaceable parts that I had not heard of? Again, again, this is a, this is like a wear item. The the like the regular part portion of the bridge, the superstructure, isn't going to have the wear on it. Whereas these panels, snow plows are going over and, and scraping them and taking the coatings off and things of that nature. Every time vehicles go over, if someone goes across the vehicle a bridge with studded tires in the winter time and spins their tires. These are all things that are going to wear it, um, whereas the rest of the bridge isn't going to deteriorate. And how much is this? Over ten thousand. Yeah, this this is um, we're buying not only um, enough panels to to redeck one of the bridges, but also um, a few bearing plates. And I don't have it in front of me. Do you have it, Brian? I know it's more than 10,000. The quote. What else was there besides the bearing plates and the deck panels? Uh, plate bearing, bearing sliding, right. and then deck compact. Yeah, but but is it a, is it a secret what the number is? Because I keep asking about- I um, see quantity 16. But dollars. This is over ten thousand dollars. So it's the whole reason for our conversation is because this is more than ten thousand dollars. Yes. So is it ten thousand and one or is it two hundred thousand? There's a lot of range there above ten thousand dollars. What's the total price of the change order you're asking for? Without getting into a breakdown of panels and other things. What's Eleven thousand two sixty eight ninety five. Eleven thousand. And, and it's in the grant budget. I mean, it's, we have the money. It is correct. It? That's the next question. There, right. There's a project summary um, in the package. It's not costing the town any money. It's just, it's just debiting our grant account. Oh. Correct. Right. If, if these were purchased, we'd still have $59,394 as our uh, remaining unobligated funds in the grant. Yeah. So we're eating into the unobligated portion. Right. Correct. And Keith, do you have your crystal ball handy? Yeah. Hopefully there's nothing else. Okay. Well, but <laughs> the word hopefully kind of makes me nervous. Yeah. Okay. I make a motion that we authorize Keith to approve this change order for the what eleven thousand two hundred eighty dollars. Second. Okay. Uh, roll call vote, Joyce. Hi. Jonathan? Yeah. Word? Yes. Okay. Okay, the next item is uh, discuss signs on public property and public rights away. Yeah. Um, I guess in the past two weeks, there's a couple things that happened in terms of, of well, there's one thing that happened in terms of signs in town. Um, and then there was some signs that were put on Chestnut Plain Road um, in terms of public rights away. And always, as we come up to an election year, um, we always have uh, signs that pop up, political signs that pop up. And sometimes they pop up on town property and in the public rights away. And I just really wanted to have a discussion as to I guess what the what the expectation of the board is in terms of those signs is if they pop up overnight, um, how do we deal with them? How do we deal with complaints that people don't like the message on the sign? Um, I just want to I just want to have that discussion to make sure that one we're treating everybody fairly and that really we're all on the same page as 
as these things may pop up. Um, okay. So I guess um, okay. maybe yep. ask that discussion. There's, I think Brian gave us an excerpt of the zoning bylaws. They talk about signs, uh, both on uh, public property, personal property, and off-premise property, and discussing the the size and location. And if they vary from that bylaw, I guess CBA has to take an action on on that sign, which they have been doing at various occasions. Uh, and I guess one one which seems appropriate for 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 that board to do that. The I guess concern I have, and, and it hasn't come up to that board yet, is some of these signs that that control or advertise or, or uh, inform of traffic conditions on the road. I, I think they're the ones that uh, the town should have the authority to, to either approve or, or if that is a need for that sign, the town should, should install that sign. Either the Either a highway department or a police department uh, should be aware of that. And if it's a condition that needs a sign, uh, it should come to the to the town to to look at that and, and and put a sign there, rather than having individuals arbitrarily make a homemade sign and put it on the side of the road and think that they are controlling traffic. Uh, there are requirements for signs. I, I think both Keith and Jim know that. Uh, the size, the color, the dimensions, the location for signs. That's, that's all, there's, there's standards for that. And that comes into play when there's a, a legal issue, a legality issue, and lawyers look at that. First thing they look at if it involves a sign or some control of traffic. Uh, then were the cases I, I think where they should come to the, to the board, to the town to, uh, uh, make a decision on, on how we want to control traffic on these uh, on our roads. If people have a problem, uh, they should come to the town and present that to us and we'll decide. Yeah, but and again, I lost my connection for a second, so I apologize if I am repeating what was discussed a little bit ago, but you know, reminding people to slow down. You know, it's kind of freedom of speech. Yeah. It, it's sort of like reminding anyone to wear a mask. It's sort of freedom of speech. And I don't think we can, we should be doing something that limits someone's ability to express their opinions. And that strikes me that's what we're, we'd be doing. Yeah, I, I think we don't have to let people put them on the same kind of posts. Like, for example, it was actually technically in Hatfield where somebody took the stop sign and they added to that post, hey, this isn't a suggestion, it's the law, or something something clever like that. And then I personally didn't object to the sign, but I think having um, people put signs on, you know, public signs that have been kind of, that have standards of the type that Fred's talking about is probably not a good idea. But if someone wants to put a sign in their front yard reminding people to slow down, reminding them that the speed limit's only 25 here or whatever it happens to be, as long as they're not offering contradictory or false information, um, now maybe their freedom of speech is to give false information and tell people it's really only 20 or something like that. So I, I don't right. know if we want to get that far, but if, I don't think we can strenuously object to someone putting something up that doesn't, um, it doesn't break any other of the bits of our bylaw. It was just reminding people of traffic laws. Right, I mean, well, you know, we, you don't see it as much around here, but if you live in any city around election time, you see telephone poles being used for, especially the night before, people, staff people will go around town and every telephone pole in town has a vote for whoever. Um, you know, I'm not a big believer that you should use public property, like physical infrastructure, like that kind of thing. But 
But again, if if somebody were to put something that happens all the time up on the overpasses over 91, well, you know, is that, you know, and then you get into one person's pork is another person's prime rib. Well, you know, I think we we've, we've got there's maybe I look at two types of signs: the information signs, the temporary signs that come and go all the time, whether it's political, whether it's advertising, whether it's sales or, or whatever. And then there's the regulatory signs, the traffic control signs. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess I don't have a problem with the, the non-traffic control signs that they come and go all the time. In, in, everywhere, and you, you see them not only our town but other towns. It's it's the ones that that people want to some to try to control traffic. Yeah, there there is some leeway, and and maybe some are aren't as uh, the message isn't as strict as, as others. But where where do, you, where do you stop that, or how do you control that? Unless you you take a position that all traffic control signs need to be approved by the town. And, 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 and that makes, to me, that makes them more effective. I mean, the town is aware of it. They placed it there for a reason. And our, our police chief is, is, is gonna enforce that because it's one of our signs. If somebody puts one out there haphazardly or, or, or doesn't conform to anything, it's like, well, it's like these, these other, other signs out there, fine. It, it, Come, they come and go. Yeah, but I, don't, I think if someone wants to paint a sign reminding people to slow down and just put it in their front yard, I don't want to. I, I, I don't want to prevent someone from doing that right. because I don't think they're trying to do traffic control the same way the town does. And if they came to the town and you're going to make them do some other kind of sign, and you say there's already a sign with the speed limit. Well, they seem to think people want to need a reminder. So, I, you know, I'm thinking of the hand-painted signs and, uh, you know, signs that are clearly not the, you know, the professional <clears throat> ones that we're required to put up for traffic control. So I, I, I guess I'm disagreeing with you, Fred, on the idea that we should censor people's speech when they want to say, hey, I'm reminding you to slow down. I don't want to censor that speech. Right. And but, I'm kind you know, of we, we should not neglect to put up proper signage. But right? we have a responsibility to do, like you say, put up proper signage. And, and there are standards to, to do that. And, and, and it, I think we're doing that. This is a signs in addition to that. Now, I will interject a little bit in the aspect that um, my feeling is as long as the, these signs, these little small signs are not being put up on the same signs that the, you know, the post that the town has put up. They're not situations where they're changing. Like, for instance, if we have a yield sign up, it's not, they're not putting up a sign that says stop or something like that. That's changing what the, what the road should be posted for or so the, these regulatory signs that we have, as long as what they're putting up and is not changing what we already have and is not impacting what we already have, I don't see that it's a huge problem. Right. They're, in most cases, they're going to come and go. And I would add to that, Keith, as long as they're not trying to portray themselves as official signs. Correct. And, and I don't think a hand-painted sign is going to make somebody have that leap of faith that, oh, this must be a new official town, the town, town policy. You know, I just think that, you know, if, if somebody wants to put up a sign because they're, you know, an animal got hit by a car, hey, reminder, the speed limit's X. You just killed my dog. You know, let them say it. I mean, why are we, no one has to agree with what they put, it's just their ability just like if somebody wants to put up in their lawn, you know, that's a stupid speed limit. Well, okay, they can do that. <laughs> I, I have just a, a couple of points, not strong opinions one way or another, but just other things to take into consideration. 
I've had this conversation a number of times with Keith um, regarding signage and the desensitization, if you want to call it that. Um, the more signs that, that people see, the less they pay attention to them. Um, so if you, in a sense, encourage it and people start putting them up all over the town, the, the message is going to go away. It's just going to be litter all over the place. That's, that's essentially what it's going to turn into. Um, and it also, I mean, you can look at it from the, the aspect as well as if you've got these signs and people are trying to read those signs, not that they can't read any other sign, but it also, if you're allowing it or encouraging it, it could create a distraction as well for somebody that's driving on the street to be reading all these other signs that they're going by. And then the last, the last point I have is just, um, I know for sure that there's certain aspects of our population that will challenge these things. And the more signs you put up, the more they challenge it. So if you put up a sign that says, slow the heck down, they're going to go by your house faster just because you put up a sign. So mm -hmm. sometimes it encourages that, that bad behavior. And that's always been my issue with the radar signs too, is I know that there's specifically, there, there are people that it slows down, but there are people that specifically try to see how fast they can get the, uh, how high they can get the number, or how fast they can get themselves going. So sometimes I, I've seen it and I've seen people that, that kind of go in that opposite direction and will, will challenge it. They'll challenge your sign by <clears throat> doing something that's not safe. But those, those are just the, the few points that I had on it. I, 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 I think that we always should remind people that shaming someone into action rarely works. You know, Abraham Lincoln tried to, tried to do that with temperance in the 1850s before he was president. It doesn't work. Or the, the I'm sorry, the temperance movement tried to do that in the 1850s. And they have to be reminded, it doesn't work. It does not restrict, it doesn't limit people's consumption of alcohol. Mm -hmm. You know, it just, but it shouldn't prevent us from, if people want to try it, hey, freedom of speech. And I don't think, I, I, Jim, you mentioned about encouraging. I don't think encouraging people to put out signs is on the table here. Yeah, so no. we're not yeah. in the business of right. either encouraging or people will take it as an encouragement people to practice their their freedom of speech mm -hmm. so it, it's mostly a matter of you know the if, if it's legal activity you know why do we need to stick our noses into it right and it may get people talking to each other and getting to know each other better and getting to understand why it is that somebody thinks the the cars are going by too fast and or whatever the issue happens to be on somebody's sign. Right. Encourage dialogue. Could I jump in here? Uh, I was just wondering if there's a distinction between opinion and advertising. If you create the distinction between opinion and advertising, then you have a definitive line between what could be allowable and what isn't. If you, unless opinion becomes so obstructive that it becomes an eyesore. Rich Facebook deals with that every day these days. Yeah, I know. But my concern is that if, if, if advertising can be regulated by the town. Opinion is difficult because it's freedom of speech. And we're trying to regulate freedom of speech and we don't want to do that. But we can recognize the fact that if, if your freedom of speech in signed form starts to impede on your neighbor's ability to enjoy their own property, then it becomes intrusive. And that may be the way to approach it or one of the ways to consider it. Yeah, I, I'm looking at the, the excerpt from the sign regulations that Brian gave us uh, to look at, and maybe this isn't complete. Um, that's all we have. <laughs> that's all we have. Okay, so yeah. it, is, it is complete. I remember asking once, and I didn't consult the bylaws, but someone um, had asked about political signs, like how long isn't there, is there a time period, like you're allowed to do this for the six weeks before the election, but not more. And, and there may be that towns have um, that kind of, I think that kind of regulation, I thought we had one, but I'm not seeing it in here unless I'm just reading too fast. Well, Joyce, I know that there are some towns, some towns that have, have um, bylaws that say the day after the election, all political signs are removed because they are, are no longer valid pieces of, you know, they're mm -hmm. not trying to impact anything any longer. Um, and those have been 
supported in court where you got to take the sign down the day after the election, you know, and, and just the way it goes. I, mean, I, I think the, the bylaw, the zoning bylaw says something about taking them down shortly after the event occurs, whatever. But, but Jim, don't, don't we have a, a, a call it regulations on, uh, I don't call it soliciting or, or vendor soliciting in, in town? If people are doing that, is there a, a limit or control of how long they can do that? No. no? Well, there is on the commercial ones that um, yeah, not not just regular solicitors. I don't. The firm and the product and service. Um, so that's one thing on those um, on commercial related signs, whether they're temporary or not. I thought I saw something on the temporary signs. Um, well, they signed well, relating to, like for sale signs, for rent signs, uh, construction signs on the premises shall be removed promptly upon completion of the activity. So like when, when, like, when the, you know, whoever painters are painting your house, the painters sign, that has to come down. Real estate sign, that has to come down when the sale is done, that sort of thing. So that's in the regulations already. Right, the, 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 the example that, I, that comes to mind is Within the last month, there's there's been uh, signs at the intersection of Christian Lane and State Road of a company advertising for help on both sides. I think it was actually on Christian Lane, maybe not on State Road. I mean, they were there for, I don't know, a week or two. Uh, then they disappeared. <laughs> I, I mean... Uh, well, I, I don't know that the owner of the property didn't say, oh yeah, go ahead, put up a sign. I mean, I, I, I don't know. They may or may not have, so. Well, they were on, I assume they were on town property and they were adjacent to the road. They, they right. had to be on town property. And, and, and those kinds of signs are put up all the time. Who's to yeah. differentiate between help wanted signs and a, a sign to promote suburban football? Or, you know, it just, it's a gray area that I don't think we want to get into. Because if you're gonna, if you're gonna say no to one kind of sign, Someone's going to say, well, no, you should say no to all the signs. Because it's, again, it's a gray area. Okay, Brian, is, you're looking at the, uh, the bylaws. Is, is there enough in there to, for, for us to uh, act on these cases that come up or, or, to, or to say it's uh, not an issue with the town, to the town? I mean, do we need something else? I mean, it... The bylaw talks about uh, the top of page 22D, temporary signs. It says signs of a temporary nature. Then it's comma, such as sales promotions. When it says such as, that usually means that, it, that, that the list that follows, it's not exclusive. So, right. um, so it's really signs of a temporary nature are allowed, but shall be removed promptly upon completion of the activity. Um, so we, we don't, and then there's some, something about nine square feet in area or 10 feet in height. 10 feet's kind of high, but um, mm -hmm. that's the, I think that's about all that we have. Um, I think there's sort of the general, there's a general authority to, to keep the roadways safe. Obviously, if signs are blocking traffic or blocking line of sight, then I think that's a legitimate reason for them to be moved. Um, sometimes we know who the owner of the sign is, sometimes we don't. Um, so... What, what are the, enfor does it list enforcement options? Because there's usually no enforcement option, whether it's a fine or forced removal, or well, if we it, tell somebody you gotta take the, take the sign down, and they say, no, I'm not taking the sign down. Um, I mean, in, in this case, it's, in the, it's within the zoning bylaw, so it would be whatever the, the mechanism is for enforcing the zoning bylaw and whatever, whatever fines there are. Um, but we don't know what that is. It's not the, the specific. I don't believe I don't believe the town has a general sign bylaw. Some towns have general sign bylaws, sign bylaws in their general bylaws, which have different mm -hmm. enforcement mechanisms. I, I Usually, a different believe, enforcement agent. I got to believe that the old sign, and I don't believe it's there anymore. But the old sign that uh, was very visible by, on ninety one for Urkel Tree Farm, that was more than ten feet tall. You know, 
Yeah. Is that off off premises though. Is that on private property? On premises, sure. But well, That's I don't know premise. that. It could have been on. It could have been on the town right away. I I don't know. Well, the right away ends somewhere shortly after the Tri Town Beach, I guess, and that road continues. Yeah. I, I again, so Fred, I I, yeah. I don't know. I never went down. And, and it may well be legal. I mean, there you can have signs that are bigger, and there's signs for businesses and. Uh, situations where you need to get, you know, permission from zoning and so on. Um, do well. I guess to me the question is: Do we feel like we need to look into um, maybe what kind of sign regulations other towns have to see if we can improve on this um, and maybe make things a little more clear? Because my main thing when I look at this is like. Well, it's just clear as mud, right? I mean, it's, um, if there's a way to make them uh, better, maybe we should consider it. It might be, but there isn't a good way to make them better. John was kind of alluding to that, that you know, well, this is a area we, where freedom of speech trumps whatever we would put into a sign regulation. Um, well, you know, it's the uh, uh, CBAs, uh, I, CBA has acted on, on signs in the past, and, and I'm sure that they're aware of what's going on or the planning board in writing the bylaw. But I think that the reason we're looking at it or discussing it now is because people are asking Brian, can they do this? Or is it allowed? I mean, we got the two incidents here. One is the obtrusive sign, and the other is, is the... Uh, say traffic uh, control sign. And, and I think they're asking Brian uh, what to do or are they allowed? Uh, I'm not sure we need to, I don't know, investigate what others are doing and, and change our bylaw. I think, I guess I'd ask Brian, does, does he have enough information based on our discussion here of what to tell people when they, when they ask you questions? Yeah. After this discussion, if someone were to ask me, I'll, I'll tell you what I what I think I'm getting is that there is there is a provision about temporary signs in the zoning bylaw. It says when they should be removed. It says something about their size, and it says something about their height. Um, and I, I I think there's agreement that it can it can create a traffic hazard in terms of reducing line of sight or or something like that right. but other than that i don't my i guess my interpretation of this conversation is that is that we would just allow people to whatever the first amendment allows that's what we would go with yeah i mean it um, can't hate speech it can't be inciting violence all those kinds of things but it can be it can be stating opinion yeah So I don't know if I interpreted this conversation correctly, but sure you did. Um, I think probably yeah. Uh, uh, I would agree with what you summarized yeah. there. That certainly, given this, un unless we were to go and investigate other bylaws, then uh, yeah, you point out the one we have, and especially with temporary signs, it's usually the the, the one that people want to put up. So. Right. Okay. okay. Uh, That's useful guidance for right. for us yeah. trying to. And not on things like telephone poles. So I can't yeah, not, on the, not on the poles that we put up with our signs. Put up your own darn pole if you're going to put up a sign. <laughs> okay. Does that mean we restrict all of the missing dogs and cat signs? Yeah. Well, that's a fair point, Jim. It, it is. I went around and collected a few dozen of them. Keith and I talked about it. And it, it becomes an eyesore. They fall off the pole. They litter it on the ground. So yeah, people, they might take those down. <laughs> but then, how else do people get that information out? Yeah, social media, what Facebook. I mean, that's the, on a yard sign. You know, save that yard sign from whatever campaign and just cover it over with new paper <laughs> and then put, you know, just don't put it on the stop signs and, and that. Right. So, okay, let's let's move on to agenda here. Uh, next item is discuss a request to purchase and install a new flagpole at the Veterans Monument. 
So, <laughs> um, the existing flagpole came down because that's where the sidewalk was going to go at the adjacent to the town hall. Um, and I think, and I think Keith, Jim is probably, Jim Ross has probably talked to you about this too, right? Yes. He, want, yeah. he wants to purchase a new flagpole and have it installed in the location of at least what the, the veterans committee is looking at for their memorial plans. Um, part of their budget? Uh, they have money for it. They have $7,500 in the project budget so far. And then there's, I think there's $2,500 in the, the, the Tom Leahy uh, donation account. Um, so it could come from either one of those. I think the cost is around three grand. Would, would this be an installation that's similar to what you have at this, the town office building? I yes. believe so. Aluminum yeah, same, pole same with design. Same design, aluminum pole with interior uh, yes. uh, mechanisms to raise and lower. Okay. Yep. And, and lighting. I think, I think this one would have a solar light to at least start. Right. Great. Thumbs up. Okay. All right. Do we need to take, uh, take action here on this or? Um, I, don't, I don't think so, as long as you guys are all right with it. Just Everybody sounds like you are. Everybody's fine. Yep. Um, so the next one was the real estate technical assistance grant. Um, I provided a summary to you guys. Um, it's based on conversations that Jonathan and I have had about Tritown Beach and sort of that adjacent area. Um, and we're, if, if the board would be so inclined, if Jonathan and I could work on that, it's the grant is due September 4th. Um, I think we would want to submit that. I, know, I, I guess I have a hard time imagining us doing anything. Well, you didn't it didn't reference specifically Tritown Beach, other than it was in that that map showing Tritown Beach. But in, in that map area, I guess I have a hard time deciding what and why the town needs to do something in that in that area because well for one we don't we own very limited land other than just the tritown beach the rest is you guys want two or three gas stations you you got you got state highways coming and going you got you got traffic incidents there in 91 ramp was rebuilt a few years ago and the signals changed because there was traffic accidents there uh I just, there, there's a marijuana establishment going to go in on, on one corner of the building there. I, I guess I have a hard time envisioning what else can we do at that location or locations on the, in that uh, map you've shown that it's going to be an, either an improvement or an attraction to, to Waitley. That's after you come to Waitley, you're leaving Waitley, well, you could be coming the other way too, I guess, southbound. Uh, I, I don't know if it's, if it's related to doing something with Tritown Beach, maybe that should be the focus and not the, the, the whole area. I, I, I just have a difficult time well, visiting Greg, that. I guess the, the point that I would make is that you don't know what works and what doesn't work unless you have people who know what they're doing help you explore opportunities. And that exploration can turn into, look at this tremendous opportunity and this is how you would do it constructively and, and smartly. And this is how you would do it not so smartly. Um, you know, we can't turn our a blind eye to the need for for smart economic development. Um, you, you can't turn a blind eye to the need, as I think you agree that Tritown Beach needs some significant work and that if work to Tritown Beach increased traffic around that area, well, that isn't a bad thing because why have Tritown Beach if two people are using the thing all year? Mm -hmm. um, there are other opportunities and, and, and we need to increase our commercial revenue so we don't continue to strangle residential taxpayers at, at, the, at their bank account. 
So this just shows, this just explores options. And we don't know what the options are at this point. So why, why do we, why do we want to persist the unknown? I mean, it's a, my understanding is the grant is about getting money to get ideas, basically. Right. We, and so we aren't using taxpayer money for asking for a grant. The grant is going to give us assistance that we might otherwise not have, and maybe we'll get some new ideas, and it's like building towards uh, getting, you know, the situation up there, I got to say, is not great. I know Tritown Beach, not necessarily that attractive these last few summers. Um, I think, you know, the fact that those shops, the Sugar Loaf shops are empty pretty much. Maybe there'll be a marijuana establishment in there. Maybe not if they never get their permits. Um, I don't, you know, they, it, it could use some help and some outside eyes would be great. And it's not going to cost us anything out of our tax base. I think that's, uh, you know, and, and, and if it in the end doesn't improve our tax base, we've lost nothing. And it's possible that we'll improve it. Let's go for it. Okay. Well, I, I guess it, to me, it also comes down to what is the priority area for t for for the town? What what areas of the town should we be trying to improving on for for development? To me, that's well, that that's on the outskirts, ed edge of town. Okay, Tri Town Beach is within the town limits, but we we've got other properties on State Road in a commercial area that are for sale, that have been sitting there for years, and some are owned by the town that are sitting there for years that we haven't developed. Why don't we look at improving them, them, them parcels of property, ideas for improving the one, at least for the one for the town. We haven't really seriously looked at that one. The town owns a five or six acre parcel on state roads, on commercial. If you'll go further south, there's also more more land that's owned commercial that is just sitting there. Yes, there is development occurring. We we've got the the concrete plant there, and and you got well muffins was expanding for a while, but you've got more open commercial land there that that's just sitting there. To me, that's that's more of an opportunity to get development in town, get traffic in town. Sure, you got access to 91 to other roads on, on State Road. Probably got a bus service that goes through there as, as well. Well, no, if no. We're going to focus on, on if the whole effort on here is to hope us focus on Tritown Beach, then we should orient this discussion and this request to what can we do for Tritown Beach or that well, immediate area in Tritown Beach, and, including and Tritown all the minor development around here that we're not going to have any control over. I just think we're, we're just spinning our wheels looking at something that, that's not going to happen. The, Fred, if you, if, well, again, Tritown Beach is an asset that we undervalue right now. We're not taking advantage of. You, you can do so much if you maximize the, the potential of, of a Tritown Beach area. I'll also remind you that, that the Sugarloaf shops and I'm not even talking about the part where the marijuana facility is going to go into, have been virtually empty for 10 years. 10 years? No, it hasn't been that long. It may be a year or two. No, no, that's only a part of that. No, the, the south side had, cool, had a hospital. Some right, hospital. but that was just on that corner. The rest of that strip from that corner all the way to what was the final markdown has been empty for 10 years. Well, it's tremendously underutilized that parcel, it, especially it, with uh, the average daily trip that goes by yeah, on that and, intersection. And, just, and to but, say, by the way, that the area served by bus by by bus transit is using bus transit very loosely because it only gets a couple buses a day, and it, it's not so. If you develop that area, you actually might find that the FRTA slash PBTA says, hmm, maybe this is a place where we want to expand bus service because people really are utilizing this area, both for residential, commercial, et cetera, et cetera. But there's no part of town that has more potential than that part of town because of access to 91, because of access to infrastructure like gas stations, like food. You know, it, it's identifying opportunity. 
And that's what economic development is. The parts of town, of town that you mentioned do not have as, as high a potential to leverage for economic development as this area does. Just don't. Well, and, and isn't this also owned by Deerfield? So it, where's not, Deerfield's input? In? Not, not, not a yard. Not a yard. Wait yeah. a minute, doesn't Deer, it's, it's, the two towns are part of the Tritown Beach. So what, yeah. is, that, what is the relationship of each town? It is still, Tritown Beach is still in the footprint of the town of Waitley. Right. And everyone I have spoken with in wait in Deerfield would welcome a complete makeover of Tritown Beach. What that complete makeover looks like, who knows? But you but you sat in enough meetings to know that no one thinks that Tritown Beach is is an appealing place to 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 for recreation. It's an underutilized asset. The finance committee is well is ready to eliminate funding. Well, we, we've got an underutilized asset on State Road. We own a, a six-acre parcel that's well, you know, if, we, if we could get a grant to do every single thing in town, we could do that. But we've got a place where at least one person really wants to work on getting this grant. And I agree, it's got lots of underutilized. If we've got other parcels in town, let's get a grant for those too, but maybe not the one that's due on September 6th. Okay, we, that's, I, I think we should just go forward with this and not quibble over which part of town should we ask for a grant for the development when we've got something that's a good candidate. Let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And let's go for this. I think we've moved it, we moved forward on trying to get this money that we don't have yet. We're trying to try to get the and we might not get it period we might not get the money either this is and the, this is the same grant that last year we applied for the we applied for the center school and the demayo lot last year to try to get help with for this grant and we didn't it wasn't competitive um so the idea was is that we would try a different part of town that that would likely be more competitive because it has more opportunities um I agree the Sugarloaf shops are, are really underutilized. Um, yeah. I checked with Lori Scar Scarborough from, from Furcog and they are estimating that the average daily trip through that intersection, the 510, um, 116 intersection is around 25, I think she said 25,000 cars a day. Um, and there's yeah. a lot of people that get off exit 24 who are traveling between Connecticut and New York and Vermont who quite crudely, I would love for them to leave some of their money in town. Um, but we need to find a mechanism to do that. Right. Um, whether it's whether it's meals tax or um, something else that you know they're all going up to subway right now, and that's in Deerfield, and we don't get meals tax from the subway across the line. And um, there's also the the parcel that I think it's called the old Fox fertilizer parcel um, that everybody I think we kind of forget that it's there. Uh, between the railroad and the Sugarloaf shops, um, that's another underutilized, underutilized parcel. It's just a slab right now, cement slab. Um, so what what are we asking for in this grant? Tell me what, what's the dollar amount. What what are we looking at? It's a range, uh, Brian. You would have it in front of you, but it's a range for the potential dollar amount. Yeah, like Jonathan was talking about, it it's it's for them to provide us technical assistance. Um, so it's a range from 5,000 to 50,000, um, just to try to help us think about, about, about what we can do differently in this area. Um, because it just seems like there's a lot of opportunity there in terms of the traffic that's going through, but we're not, we don't seem to be gaining any benefit from it. And, and you know, Fred, it, it, I would, I would write into this that um, we would, would want to do an environmental impact study around Tritown Beach. Tritown is certainly going to be a focus because that's the, that's the main asset that the town has. But we need to do an environmental study to see what, needs, what, what, what work needs to be done on that, on that area. And then that will leverage other possibilities in that, in that larger footprint. So getting back to Brian, what you're saying is that 
that's money that would go to the town to hire somebody to do this type of study? Or is there somebody available that will do that for us for that price? Is the state offering somebody to do that for us? Um. No, I, I believe it's it's mass development staff that would do it. And then they farm out skill sets that they may not have, but they're offering their skill set. And again, if they if they lack certain skill sets, they would they would help us farm it out under that under that cost structure. Right. I I, I don't believe we would just get cash and hire our own person. I think it's what's the I, I what's the cash tied to this? I, I don't understand if their staff is coming out to do it to do this study. What is well, the cash for? They they the value of the services. Mass development is not fully funded by the state. They do much much like Burcog, they do projects that they they look for funding to pay for their own staff. Right, so right whatever their source of revenue is here, that is allowing them to pay for staff. Uh, again, to find other consultants who don't have this, this capacity. If we do an environmental impact study, they would be giving us money to hire someone who knows how to do that because I, I'm pretty sure mass development does not have that skill set. It, it, you know, economic development is very complex. Yeah, I'd like to call the question I mean, this is, this is more discussion than this item needs. Let's apply for a grant. We might get it, we might not. And I think this is the right place to oh. apply the grant to, given our experience last year of trying to do something with under a different property didn't really work. I just like call the question. Uh, I guess I'm still, you say applying for a grant. Well, it's applying for technical assistance, I guess, rather than to use money that we would that. not have to pay for because somebody else is paying for the technical assistance. So there's no cost, there will be no cost to the town? No cost to the town. This is, we, my understanding from uh, how many years I've been on select board is whenever there's a chance to get something that we don't have to pay for, we should probably vote for it unless it's going to cost in, in some other way. And I don't see where this is costing us in any other way. So I, I would move that we uh, yeah. apply for the real estate technical assistance grant. It sounds like John and Brian uh, are willing to do that and have time to take care of it before the deadline. I move we do that. Second. Okay, so I think Brian, you put together an, uh, an application or something that we saw for that. Do we have to? sign off on that or what what's the deal if we approve this well if you uh, i think you you would authorize jonathan and myself to work on it and then submit it because it, it would it would happen before our before our next regularly scheduled meeting i mean a real the application is, is really not that complex um okay i i, I looked at i don't know if there was the final version of what you sent the other day in the beginning, there was boxes checked of what type of activity you're looking at. Yeah, that uh, that wasn't uh, that uh, that that wasn't intentional. And I think the one I, I did not see checked, I, I think, is a possibility is affordable housing there. Even say converting sugarloaf shops to housing. I mean, is, is that sure, an option? I, I, I think that should be checked. Are we looking for how we could be looking for affordable housing there? We, we, it, it, we could look at that as an option. I would caution that we don't want to take sugar loaf shops off of our commercial tax rolls, but that would always be an option. And if we put more, check more than boxes on that page, would that improve our application? We would have to look at that. I, I, don't, I, I can't answer that right now. We would have to look at it. I, I've written a lot of grants in my life and, and it's always my practice to actually write something that will improve our chances of getting the grant as opposed to lessen our chances of getting a grant. So, and I, and I believe this has been motioned and, and seconded. 
Okay. Any other discussion? I was wondering if I could jump in on this. You know, one of the things as far as the Tritown Beach, one of the things that I think it's really important to recognize is that the usability of the Tritown Beach usually ends around the second week of July because of the bacteria count. Whatever gets done has to recognize that. If you can extend the usage of Tritown Beach, it'll extend the ability for people to want to be in that area. The other thing is, as a resident of Route 5, I want the board to recognize that there are at least 11, 12 houses on Route 5, they are residential homes. And any development commercially that gets done has to take into consideration these residential homes are homes. And I wanna make sure that the board recognizes that and that that voice is being uh, said, spoken of. Because <clears throat> as a resident of Route 5, I feel that we don't get, the same recognition as, and we don't get the same benefit of the flavor of Waitley as other parts of town. So it's important that when the development of Route 5 happens, and I recognize how that it's important, and I recognize that how, how it benefits the town, but there are 11 residences that are affected directly by that growth. And I want the board to recognize that. When you say 11, we're, we're, what are the limits of the 11? The limits of the 11? Uh, you have Dave Arnold, you have Jim Galunka, you have myself, you have uh, the, the Lorenzi home, you have um, uh, Peter Flynn's house, you have the house across the street, Megan and Tyler. You have, there's two more houses down the road from there, three more across from, um, the hot dog stand, you have another house just down farther there, and then and then also down by the Sugarloaf house, I know that there's a home right next to that. So I wanted you to recognize that there is a number of residential homes that are affected by the commercial character of the property or of the, of the, of the environment. You know, when I sit here in my own home, and I think about what it's like to live someplace else. It's quiet. It's, it's, there's no light pollution. There's no noise pollution. There's no other things. The value of the character of my home is different from the value of the character of the homes you're living in because you're farther away from that commercial environment. And so I agree that we need to have a greater commercial footprint in Waitley because it provides for the tax revenue of Waitley. But it also has to consider that the fact that there, there are homes and we don't really benefit from that commercial environment. I don't get any benefit if I'm having a residential experience here from the commercial experience around me. There's nothing that I gain from that. And, and my property realistically doesn't have any more value because there's commercial property around me. It's not, it doesn't have more value as a commercial home. It certainly doesn't have more value as a, as a, or as a residential home or, or commercial property. Because as a commercial property, you have a residential home here that has to be removed in order to put a commercial building. As a... Is it okay if I break in here? Oh, certainly. It's getting really late and we're getting really off topic, off the agenda. So I'd like us to just, we're not talking about that stretch of five and 10, we're talking about a different stretch of five and 10. I recognize completely that five and 10 has got a lot of uh, mix with residents and believe me, this is just to get ideas. This is just to get ideas of how we could develop and there's a democratic process by which everybody has a voice in what happens. Okay, I guess we're ready, ready for a vote. Joyce, would you please restate your motion that you made? I move that we apply for the Real Estate Technical Assistance Grant as described for mass development. Okay, and Jonathan okay. seconded. He's okay. already seconded. All those, uh, roll call vote. Okay, Joyce? Aye. Jonathan? Yes. Fred? Yes. And is this include, this means, do we need a separate action to allow Jonathan to sign? I, um, I don't think so. If he needs us to sign, we can come in and sign, I guess. But. Yeah. No, because we've given Brian the authority to sign these kinds of things on, on occasion anyway. He can sign my name better than I can. It requires a letter of municipal support, and um, we can have that um, 
drawn up and signed. Okay, so tell us when we need to come in to sign. Yep. Okay. Okay, moving on. Uh, discuss and sign memorandum of understanding with Franklin County Solid Waste Management District for a household hazardous waste day to be held on September 26th. Yep, so there's an MOU that it's, we sign one of these every year. Um, we budget $1,200 for household hazardous waste. Residents can sign up and they can bring their dangerous chemicals and, and they can drop them off and get them out of town. Um, anything, of, um, that's pretty much it. Yep. The two locations are uh, Greenfield Community College and the Orange Transfer Station. Um, and it'll be September 26, 2020. And this is what we do every year. Right. And we don't need to take, action, take any action, do we? Uh, we just need you to need sign the MOU. Okay. And agree to the cost. Is that part of the MOU? The cost yep. is, isn't the cost incurred by the people who utilize the, <coughs> the service? We budget. We budget twelve uh, twelve hundred dollars. Oh, we do. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I make a motion to sign the MOU. Second. Okay. We'll call a vote. Uh, Joyce. Aye. Jonathan. Yeah. Fred. Yes. Okay. Down to uh, town administrator updates. Brian. Um, we have the results back from the the, the municipal aggregation and. Um, 85, what is it, 85.7% of residents who were eligible to participate in the program uh, decided to stay in the program. Um, so that's about it. Um, I thought I had it pulled up here. I could have sh shared my screen quickly, but I think I think that the, that's the, the the top line message to send that yeah. a huge majority adopted this. There we go. Yep. So there were 771 eligible, 100, 110 opt out, um, 16 were rejected at the utility. Usually that's because there's the I think we were told that the accounts don't exist or they're old accounts. Um, nine people who were not on the original enrollment list decided to opt in. Um, so that was current enrollment total was 654 residents. Um, zero chose the um, RPS plus 25 mass class one recs and four people chose a 100% mass class one recs. I say 400, I meant four. Four people chose the 100% mass class one recs. Yeah, it's getting late, Brian. It's getting very late. Okay, um, that's good news. Good news. Uh, we talked about most of these other ones. Um, the water commissioners met today. They um, made an award for the to purchase of booster pumps for the uh, the pumping station, so that way um, they can bring their pumping capacity back up to where it was. Um, what's and price, what's the price of that award? Um, good question. I think it was twenty four. It was a twenty four thousand or twenty five thousand, I believe. It was definitely between twenty four and twenty five thousand, but I don't know the exact figure. And this was for a booster pump, so that would be replacing what they have, or or is it just an add on? No, it adds into this. It it adds into the system, the existing system. Additional pumps. Okay. Yeah. Um, and did they say how soon this could be done? Um, well, I think they're going to they're, they're, they're gonna, uh, essentially do the project themselves, whatever the order time is, whatever the lead time is for the manufacturer to, to ship them out. Oh, okay. Okay. And then um, somebody at the planning board meeting yesterday, Really, this I was putting this on here to, to provide an update about um, in terms of the Monaghan property, and I, I think the, the the end result was the planning board was going to write a letter um, to the Monahans asking them to consider um, um, submitting for a zoning change to to make the property commercial. Um, 
but there, there's more discussion to be had on that, I believe. Okay, is that it? That's about it. We got, well, one last thing. Um, I, I think it'd be a good idea to send a, well, I want to know what your thought is. Um, we received a $60,000 donation from Smith College for Poplar Hill Road. Um, so I don't know if we want to compose a quick thank you letter. Absolutely. Um, okay. Yeah, just yeah. please. That's it. Speaking of donations, did we get the one for the Whitley Inn yet? Um, Keith was going to follow up on that. Okay. So, so I, I don't, I don't believe we've had it yet. Okay. Well, can I move that we adjourn? Second. Okay. Roll call vote. Joyce. Aye. Jonathan. Yep. Fred. Yes. Okay. Meeting adjourned.